Hello, everyone, and welcome to this introduction to the ArchivesSpace API. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for ArchivesSpace, and I'm joined today by your workshop instructor, Valerie Adonisio of Atlas Systems. We are using Zoom webinar for this workshop, and your microphone and camera were both muted. If you'd like to ask a question of Valerie, I ask that you use the Q&A option on your screen. It's right at the bottom. Uh, if you have a general question, need some form of assistance, or just want to reach out and talk to your fellow workshop attendees, please use the chat option. Questions will be read and answered during allocated time for Q&A. And some questions may be answered directly in the Q&A in an effort to keep training on schedule. So keep an eye on that chat to see if there's some additional resources that are posted there. You also have the ability to turn on closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can elect to show or hide subtitles by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen and pressing the little up arrow there. You can also elect to view the full transcript either in tandem with the subtitles or in lieu, in the, in lieu of the subtitles by selecting that option. If you need any technical assistance during this workshop, feel free to chat me, Jessica Crouch, privately if you'd like to. Keep in mind that uh, if you're using an earlier version of Archive Space than the one Valerie's using today, some of the features you see may not be available. We also won't be able to troubleshoot your own individual implementations of Archive Space. So if you have questions or issues with your implementation, please feel free to email us at archivespacehome at lyricist.org. And before I turn things over to Valerie, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Valerie's introduction to this workshop. Part presentation and part in-depth demo, this workshop will introduce attendees to the ArchivesSpace API. Using the ArchivesSpace API enables the user to perform tasks like bulk actions that are not possible or are more time consuming to accomplish in the ArchivesSpace staff user interface. The presentation will establish important concepts while the demos bring those concepts into reality. Uh, please note that this is not a hands-on workshop and has instead been designed as an in-depth tutorial that will have live examples and plenty of time for Q&A. As I said, your instructor today is Valerie Adonisio of Atlas System. I'm going to let her introduce herself, but let me just say that I have been in a version of this workshop with Valerie before, and it is absolutely outstanding. Sorry to set you up like this, Valerie. Uh, it's a great way to learn about the Archive Space API and APIs in general. So no pressure, but Valerie, take it away. Okay, so you should all be seeing a full sized version of the first slide of my presentation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. Thank you, Jessica, for that awesome setup that I will fall from the pillar of. Uh, so just a note, if anything does go uproariously wrong today and any of the live demos don't work, I promise that I will re-record the presentation either in part or in whole, and then we will stitch that together. Also, in case I go over time, which I sincerely doubt, I am going to keep recording. Um, and I will, that way that the, uh, the version of this that lives on into the future is the most most complete version. So as Jessica said, my name is Valerie Adonisio, and I'm the Special Collections and Archives Technical Consultant at Atlas Systems, and we're a registered service provider and hosting provider for archive space. But before that, in 2016, I was tasked with migrating my formal, former institution from Archivist Toolkit to Archive Space. Up until that point, I was a processing archivist, and that's actually one thing I want you to know about this. Um, by the end of this presentation, I am going to be like, working in Python and going crazy on scripts. And I promise you to that prior to this stage of my career, I considered my specialty to be 19th century photography and the ability to date late 1890s prints. So that was where I started in my career. I was very much a paper-based archivist. And so if you have any doubts about, and I did not ever intend on this becoming my career and I didn't actually enjoy the journey and that's why I have been teaching the API ever since. Uh, the long story short is after we moved into archive space the scale of our legacy data cleanup problems and then the scale too of their solutions completely changed my professional life and I have been teaching the API in one form or another ever since. So your first question or observation is, why is this a presentation and not a workshop? I have taught API workshops and they are brutal. My best memories of them is looking out into a sea of very stressed out faces. 
your hardware will fail. You can't install the same thing as your neighbor. I go really fast. You run a script. You walk away feeling like you survived a workshop, but not necessarily that you've learned anything. And so I have ever since having that experience, and I did that a number of times, I've kind of stepped it back and stepped it back because I don't think that workshops, hands-on workshops are necessarily suited to foundational concepts. And the thing with the API is, it is a foundational concept. You're going to have to change the way that you think about your data. And some of you in the audience may already be on your way towards changing how you think about your data. And uh, that's great. But some of you, if you've come to this, this is a beginner's workshop. So I am going to start in at the beginning. So I have begun to think that a hands-on workshop is really better off as a part two to this part one. I don't know that I'm promising a part two right now because I am exhausted <laughs> from putting this together. But just know that um, I'm totally acknowledging the fact that this is not a workshop, but I believe I have done you a service. I hope you'll trust and believe in that. Also, this is a journey. And I'm like, no, really, this might take you a while. So if um, I believe that workshops, it, I, I believe that any journey that's particularly this long should be a something where you can uh, lay the foundations early, and then kind of proceed on your journey. And finally, I genuinely think what I'm about to show you is the best I can do for an introduction. So perhaps to belabor the point, and I don't worry, I'll start talking about the API at some point, but uh, this has been a journey for me personally. So five years ago, I was facing years of frustration and failure about legacy data cleanup. Um, this, this could be anything from trying to reconcile data that's in two different systems, trying to get those two systems to talk to one another, talking about stuff that is just outright wrong. Um, looking at encoding practices that we had used back in our EAD universe that didn't make any sense anymore in a database. And I was faced with, well, you can solve that stuff. How exactly? And so I knew that the API was a thing. Maybe you are here today because you know the API is a thing. But it took me years of frustration and failure to get from five years ago to right now. I also have to thank some really excellent colleagues. And one of the points here is not just to bring these people up on the screen and give them like credit, but to mention that there is a human component to this. I really did need help and I really did need individuals to help me. I also needed a little just straight up formal education. I took um, at least 15 weeks of Python classes. I think that's about what it was. And I took a real course. You can see it there through Coursera. Not a paid recommendation, just letting you know that that one, Python for Everybody, really worked for me. So let me just see what's up. Yes, Dr. Chuck is the best from the chat. Loved him. He's got a lot of personality too. So you won't be bored in his class. OK. I also copied others, and this is something that is going to feel uncomfortable perhaps, but um, in as you move into perhaps the scripting and programming world, there is actually an expectation, and it is often done with permission because there's licensing on scripts essentially or rights statements that say, sure, you can use my code. And so I have had personal conversations with Laura and Eric and Austin where I'm like, hey, can I use your code? And I just took it. I took it with their permission, and then I learned it after I made it work for myself. So there is a bit of a strange learning journey here, where sometimes you start with a final product, which is kind of what you're getting today. You're getting a final product from me today. And my recommendation to you is now reverse engineer it. So that's what I mean by copying others. And learning by teaching. So I taught a lot of API workshops learn some pretty hard lessons. And then this is the presentation that you get after all of that experience. Then I had an unanticipated career shift. So my point is that I can't do all of this in three hours or eight hours or 20 hours. And you're asking, well, I, we're not asking you to do all of this in three hours or eight hours or 20 hours. But after having this whole experience, I do think that these three hours that I'm about to give you I really sincerely hope we'll prepare you for the rest. So what am I about to give you? This recording, which is actually pretty significant. I think that you should watch this again if you end up pursuing this. You might watch this today and be like, nope, not for me. But if you watch this today and you're interested in the journey and you go on that journey, maybe you go take Dr. Chuck's class, come back to this presentation, especially the second half of it. I have 
uh, purposefully put in things that I think that you should return to. I'm also giving you what I call my API playbook. Uh, this is a shout out to the um, EAD cookbook from uh, many years ago. This is a guide for your next steps, and we're going to talk about that at the end. That API playbook further includes some API client instructions. That doesn't make any sense to you uh, yet, but this is where you should start when we're finished today together if you want to pursue this. And I will also be giving you uh, not all of the scripts I demonstrate today because some of them don't make sense to give you. They are uh, teaching scripts. They don't accomplish anything. They just show you things. But I will be giving you the scripts that actually accomplish something. And all of that is going to be available. The API playbook and the scripts will all be available via a link. I'm going to post that link in the chat and you can bookmark it. But I admit to you that it is not fully the way I want it to look yet. <laughs> so you can go check it out now. Uh, but this was my last priority. The slides and the scripts were my first priorities. Okay, so that's all of the introduction about who I am and whether or not you care about any of that. Let's talk about it. Let's get to it. Let us lay the basic foundations for what is an API? What is the archive space API? How do you use it? So what's an API? Ha <laughs> ha. An API stands for, it's an acronym, stands for Application Program Interface. Don't worry, that means nothing. But if you ever see it referred to as an Application Program Interface, it is an API. Notice the word interface there. We use interface in other capacities in, our, in uh, the archive space land. There's the staff interface and the public user interface. And so I'm setting you up for the idea that the application program interface is just your third of three possible interfaces. I am lumping this in with the staff user interface and the public, public user interface. And I'll show you why I have a graphic a little bit later that talks about, it sort of visualizes that for you. There are many types of APIs. These things are all around you all the time. You use them constantly. If you logged into anything today on your phone, you used an API. If you logged into your email, if you went to any, probably any website, if you went to your bank, you used an API today. So there are many types. Archive Space specifically has a REST, and the REST actually does stand for something, Web API. This is the most I'm going to talk about this because you don't need to know this. But when you start to use the look at the universe of APIs, say you do begin to script, it might matter as you look for documentation in different directions to know that Archive Space has a RESTful web API. And like I said earlier, you use APIs constantly. Anytime that you pretty much anytime that you are putting your username and your password into something and you're getting data back, like going to your bank, and getting your data, getting your where's your bank account information. And you know how you can get that on both your computer, like your, your desktop computer and your laptop? It's because both of those different uh, devices are being served from the same API. So you use APIs constantly. And one of the things I'd actually like to share with you today is, or one of the things I want you to take away is the knowledge that these are not that special, just that you using one manually is special. That leads me to my next point. They aren't specifically meant for this. And what does this mean? This is a human interacting with an application. APIs are meant for applications to interact with applications. The reason this is all going to feel weird for you or potentially uh, like a really big barrier of entry for the rest of the day is because it is a big barrier of entry. APIs are specifically meant for Say, um, if you were if you attended um, any of the programs yesterday that talked about integrations, and for those of you watching in the future, I'll, by that I mean if there is another application interacting with Archive Space, say Archivematica or Aeon or something else that two applications are together pushing data back and forth between Archive Space, that is what an application program interface is meant for. By you, a human being, inserting yourself in that. Uh, interface back and forth. That's the tough part. And though one of the reasons it's tough is because it is tough. It was really just meant for computers to talk to computers, not humans to talk to computers. We as archivists have kind of inserted ourselves into that to take advantage of what the API can do for us. 
Okay, one other thing about APIs, it does it, the API, does nothing by itself. Think of it like an open microphone. An open microphone does nothing until the moment someone steps up and speaks into it. Otherwise, it sits silently waiting for input. So the API is quiet. It's humming away. It does nothing until you show up and ask it a question or you show up and push data at it. So it itself isn't doing anything until you interact with it. Whether you're interacting with it without knowing through the staff interface, the public user interface, or the application programming interface. Okay, now, key point. The API gives you the same data you're used to, just a different view. So I mean that the API is just another way to interact with your data. Here's your data. It's in a server. It's on a server in the cloud somewhere. If you're locally hosted, it's on a server on the other side of campus. If you're in with a hosting provider, it's on a server someplace else. So your data is up there somewhere. And then you can interact with it through the staff user interface, the public user interface, or the API. Here's that visualization I promised you earlier. These three things, by the way, if you're ever um, stuck in some technical documentation, are represented by three port numbers. If you've ever been reading technical documentation about this or any other application and you see references to the 8080 port, that's the staff user interface, 8081 is the PUI, and 8089 is the application program interface. Um, one of the things I'm trying to emphasize here is that it's always the same data. The API is not showing you anything different than what these other two things show you. It just shows you something differently via a different route. And the route there is the 80 versus the 81 versus the 89. So I'll uh, enforce this with an example. Here is a view of the archive space staff user interface. You are used to seeing this. This, by the way, is going to be, I always use something along the lines of the Morris Canal Company photographs or the Morris Canal, I think this time it's the Morris Canal Company records. I just riff off of this uh, canal company from uh, early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th, uh, 20th century New Jersey. So here is the staff interface. So we're looking at what we might call a finding aid, but we're at the resource level of a finding aid. Here's that exact same information through the public user interface. So here's still the Morris Canal Company photographs, same data, different view. Here's yet another view of it, XML. If you still use EAD, if EAD is part of your life, or if you use exports from it, here again, same data. This is still the Morris Canal. See, look, it's called papers in this example because I didn't get my screenshots all taken at the same time. Morris Canal Company papers in this case, but my point being, it's the same data, different view. So if you are used to thinking of this as, okay, I get it, it's the same data, three different views. These just happen to be three views that you're familiar with. Now what I'm here to do is introduce you to a fourth view that you're not familiar with. I'm gonna pause on that. I pause a lot. It's one of my favorite ways to present is to just let you kind of sit back and know that I'm not going to I'm not going to go through slides too quickly. So here again, I see Morris Canal Company photographs. It's easy to read. I can see those words right there. And if depending on how deeply familiar you are, if you can like close your eyes and picture the staff user interface, pretend you're, you know, entering data in and you're checking things. Well, here's the publish button. So Morris Canal Company Photographs is published. If you can really picture the staff user interface, you also know that there's like a, a, there's a restrictions checkbox kind of near the published checkbox. Well, in this case, it's unchecked, it's false. Here's the EAD ID. Here's my finding aid title. So if you can really picture the staff interface now, now we've scrolled down a little bit through our resource record and we're in the finding aid data section. So here's the finding aid title. Here's my finding aid date. Here's my uh, language information. And then there's some system data created by admin, you know, dates, system times, all that kind of stuff. But 
This is the same data, the Morris Canal Company Photographs resource record, but in a format called JSON. And don't worry, we will be talking about that. Oops, I didn't mean to click, go back through the API. Now for the keenest eye among you, you'll see, look down here, subjects. There are two links out to subjects. So this must be a resource record with two subjects attached to it. Okay, so there is our same data, different view. Foundational, early, easy concept about the API. So it's not showing you any different. Well, actually, I'm going to go in a little bit later about how uh, the API is subtly different than the staff user interface and what it shows you. But it's still the same data. You're just getting a different view of it. So how do you access this same data, different view? Where do you get this from? That's what we're going to spend most of today talking about. So we will be tackling this how to access it throughout the entire presentation. But there's some really basic basic stuff that we can talk about first before we go uh, kind of deep into the examples. So we'll start with some basics about access. You access the API via a URL. That might come as a surprise to some of, to some of you, but it may be familiar to others. So if you've already done a little bit of basic API work, probably the first piece of information you have uncovered in your quest is what is your, and then your is insert name of institution here. So say you are at uh, institution of higher learning or a corporate archive or wherever you work, what is your archive spaces APIs URL? your department or hosting provider should have that address. So if that isn't an answer that you already like, oh, I know what it is, then that whoever you write your, hey, archive space crashed. If you write an email, hey, archive space crashed, whoever that person is on the other side of that email is probably the same person to whom you would address the question, hey, what's our URL for our API? So here is a real one. That is the API address for the sandbox. So the sandbox that's hosted online by uh, Lyricis is sandbox.archivespace.org. That part of the address is the same. So if you were to click on that, you could go log in and play around in the sandbox. But if you add slash API slash on the end of that, you will get that is the URL for the sandboxes API. And eventually, I'm actually going to click on that and show you what it looks like if you click on it in a browser. So all Archive space comes with an API out of the box. So if you are running Archive space, there's an API. But your IT department or hosting provider may have to enable it. So it's a port that they have to turn on. So right now, you could write that email to your IT department and say, hey, what's our API address? And they could write back and say, there isn't one because we haven't enabled it yet. So that conversation may end up being, hey, do we have one? Is it on? No? OK. Uh, I have permission from insert name of supervisor to ask you to please in, to please enable our API. And then once your uh, archive space will have to be restarted, you will get then your URL. If you happen to be running a local install of archive space, uh, so this means if you're running a blank archive space directly on your computer, those already have it on by default. There is no turning it on, there is no turning it off. So if you run a local install on your computer, it, it, local installs have it on by default via localhost 8089. And I know that that doesn't look like a URL the way that the other one does, HTTP slash slash sandbox, but you could type localhost 8089 into your browser uh, like, like, a, like Mozilla, like Firefox, and it will navigate to it, to your local uh, archive space, if you have it running. So I may have lost you on that sentence, but if I didn't lose you and you're somebody who runs a blank archive space on your computer, you can just get to it by going to localhost 8089. If I did lose you, don't worry. I'll kind of come back to this in a little while. I, for this presentation, am actually running archive space locally on Windows. So today, when we work together, I will be navigating to localhost 8089. Okay. Oh, and one last important point. This last one here. You log into the API via a local ASpace user account. So I'm going to assume that the group of people who are attending today fall into one of two categories. 
you just when you go to to archive space you, it's like oh, okay tomorrow is like we have to go all back to work right we're not attending the uh, user forum anymore so you're gonna sit down at your computer and you're gonna type in your username and password and you're gonna log into archive space how do you how are you doing that are you doing that using your potentially say a university's enterprise level authentication system where you're using the same username and password say that you use to log into your institutional's email or are you using just a little login screen from archive space if you don't know what i mean by this question then you're probably falling in the second category you're probably a local a space user so i can kind of point this out when i actually move out to the web and i show you archive space you cannot use your institutional's uh, account and auth authentication to access archive space. So if you are somebody who works at a major university, say, and you're logging in via your university's authentication method, you cannot access the archive space API. You will have to create or have someone at your institution create for you a local A space user account like you were a normal archive space user. And I'll go into this a little bit later, but this is another thing to ask your IT department. And if you're confused by this sentence so far and you're not sure which of those two people you are, work out whether or not you're using your big, big capital A authentication system or whether you're just logging into a local A space user account. I will be using the admin account today, which is a local A space user account. And I'll go into this a little bit more like when we go out to the web. Okay, why use it? If you're here, you probably already have a little bit of the why, but I'll talk about this a little bit and leave you uh, with ambiguous statements, which aren't really helpful. <laughs> but the biggest thing is, is that it enables work at scale. This is the point. This is why I learned it. I'll actually have to say I had to learn it because the scale at which my problems were, I just would be the rest of my career to solve manually. So it is everything about using the API is in function to scale. You don't have to use it for things that are fast and small. Uh, so don't automatically think that once you learn the API that you have to use it for everything. Use it. The API is in uh, service to scale. The bigger the scale of the problem, the easier probably the solution to is, is to uh, use the API for it. So I've given this presentation a number of times. And so for the first time ever, I'm actually going to pause on these words because I always thought that they were just very um, obvious in the past. But I interrogated this a little bit myself because over the last year, this exact year, about a year ago, I think, uh, I gave this, uh, oh wait, no, maybe it was August, I gave this presentation recently. And then since then, I learned a whole lot of <laughs> new stuff about uh, SQL, about using SQL against the database, uh, which is a different method for making changes than uh, using uh, Python and the API. So for the first time, and then that kind of opened my mind and kind of blew my brain and said, man, really, the API isn't the only solution to my problems anymore. So for the first time ever, I'm going to pause on these words. It enables work at scale. Scale isn't in question. The API lets you work on any scale the end. So if you have a huge project or if you have a small project, the API will expand or contract its abilities for however big you want to go. It's really what work do you mean? What work do I mean and what work do you mean? So you registered for this workshop because you know that the API is a thing, but thinking about what you will ultimately accomplish is important as you start this journey. And this is something that I'm going to return to throughout the presentation because I'm actually going to at some point suggest that not everything needs the API. And it's almost going to be a point that happens almost at the very end, but you'll see why I wait for the end in order to, to show it to you. So I want you to I want to, to confess that this presentation has always been based on my real life, and that life used to be primarily data cleanup. But And so maybe you'd be like, bing, I'm a data cleanup person, Valerie, please help me. So I'm here for you. But what I mean, uh, by the way, by data cleanup is changing existing data by improving migrated and legacy data. So notice I'm talking about existing data. Data cleanup, in my mind, means that the data already exists and then needs to be cleaned. 
I also do data ingest, and that I will define as creating new records, new links, new information, or perhaps old information used in new ways. But if you're bringing new information into archive space for the first time, I'm going to say that that's a slightly different uh, it's, it's like a universe of skills and a universe of project management than I use for data cleanup. I mentioned my work because that's how I designed this workshop and it's how I have approached everything I've done for the last four years. When there's that much going on in relaying personal experience into a teaching environment, that probably means there's assumptions in what I'm about to tell you today. So there's assumptions in this presentation. When I started teaching the API, it was how I tackled all my problems. I had one hammer for all tasks. I was proud of that. But now four years later, I now choose between two hammers. I choose Python in the API, which is what today is, but I also choose SQL and the database. And so by that, I mean that I used to work exclusively in the API, the Application Program Interface. Now I work directly in the database almost over 50% of the time. So 50% of the challenges that I solve now, I actually solve with SQL in the database. So that's why I say the last year of my life has completely changed how I think about API work. So the, so, but yeah, that's the, just to say that Python and the API happens down in the API and SQL in the database happens up there. And over the last year, I've actually done this third thing of uh, Python plus SQL plus the database plus API. And it's because I'm expanding my skills, expanding my language knowledge and expanding the things that I face on a daily basis. So I say all of this because um, I don't want you to leave today thinking that the Python, uh, that Python and the API is your only option. And if you go for it, if you learn it, if you make changes, there may come out for you in your life, depending on the type of work you want to do, different opportunities that don't use Python and the API. So keep your mind open to them. But we're here as beginners, so we're going to start there. Just a quick note, the API enables different types of work at scale. So I've been, I told you, I, I usually kind of just default to data cleanup and uh, data input. You can also use work at scale to mean different things. And here are three, uh, four examples. The Archive Space Awesome list has an incredible array of examples of the API doing things that aren't just data cleanup or data, or, uh, data creation. So remember that that's the inherent assumption in this presentation, but there are other things out there. Uh, Noah Huffman and Tracy Jackson at Duke use the API to create Trello cards for project management. That has nothing to do with, da with, data, with cleaning data. That's just project management but the data is still being gotten out through the API. Uh, Corey Schmidt at the University of Georgia uses the API for batch exporting. So again, not cleanup, not data ingest. He's actually using it to get data out. And uh, Kevin Trotman and David Hodges at Columbia use two APIs for reporting and updating. So um, this is me just acknowledging how many assumptions I make that you're here to learn about data cleanup because that's what I do. And that shouldn't be what it is. That's why I want to point these things out to you before we get too far into it. Because once you see how I approach project management, you might think that's the only way to do it. It's the best way to do it for data cleanup and data ingest, not necessarily for all of these other different ways that different humans have applied different brains to the same functionality. So finally, just ask yourself, it's not going to matter right now, but what do you want to do at scale? Do you want to change data, delete data, create data, connect data, report data, import data, export data? You might not know yet. That's totally fine. But remember to keep learning because there will be better, different tools depending on what you're trying to do. But this is the last time I'm going to talk so big picture and kind of ask you these ambiguous questions that you're not really prepared necessarily to answer. I'm going to, I'm going to come back down to earth from here on in and talk about the practicalities of it. But this is my way of saying that if you're not me and you're not doing exactly what I'm doing, this presentation, uh, this part of the presentation, I think is genuinely useful to everyone. But when we get to, back to the scripts that I show you at the very end, they were designed with data cleanup in mind. So, hmm. 
Okay, and finally, why use the API? Because it enables applications to communicate directly. This is the true function of APIs. We're just capitalizing. So the whole reason that APIs exist in the first place is so that archive space can be connected to any other application with an API. This is already happening with the LCNAF plugin in archive space because the LCNAF plugin goes out to, um, what is it, id.gov's API and pulls data in. So because this is one that we're uh, very familiar with, it's the first, it came with archive space. This is the one that I highlight, but there are now dozens of these uh, APIs that communicate or, or archive space is communicating with ingest name of thing, Primo, Archivematica, Aviary, I think I saw a lot of talk about yesterday about how uh, Aviary might have an API and it interacts with archive space. So, multiple applications uh, communicating together. And so this, of course, has actually sort of always just been the dream, is that one day we will be able to manage our data in only one place, our database of record. And if it needs to communicate with other applications that either maybe have digital preservation data about our holdings or that have uh, the library catalog, the joy of this, the future of this has always been that one day all of these APIs are going to communicate with each other. And this is the point of them all existing. Inserting ourselves as humans into this, it causes friction because it's tough because computers were really the ones supposed to be doing this on our behalf. Okay, so I'm actually going to pause there just for a minute to see whether we have any questions. And I don't think that we do. So I'll give it just a sec. I'll take a sip of water and then we're going to really move into some computer science. <laughs> so just pause for just a moment. Okay, awesome. So the introductory part of this presentation is over. Now let's get into the real heart of it. So this section is entitled Everything is a Conversation, and it will introduce to you the concept, if you're not already familiar with it, of the request and response cycle. And this is where we really begin to get into the practicalities, the real life of the API. So what is the request response cycle? Request response, or it's also sometimes called request reply, is one of the basic methods computers use to communicate with each other, in which the first computer sends a request for some data and the second responds to the request. Usually there is a series of interchanges until the complete message is sent. So imagine uh, any time that you are on the web, you, for instance, maybe start off with a Google search. You Google the thing that you want. That is sending a message to Google. It's a request. Google finds whatever it is that you're looking for and sends a response. Request, response. Then you go and click on whatever website that you've just searched for. You found it. You are navigating to it. And then once you're there, you are requesting information perhaps from it. You click a link in there. It shows you another page. You click another link. It shows you another page. You're actually having a conversation with that web page. You're having a conversation with Google. A conversation is called the request and the response cycle. Uh, you also do this in other applications. Uh, whenever you click send and receive all folders in Outlook, I like to use this as a good example. You click this button and you make stuff happen. But what you're actually doing is you're requesting new email from the server. You wait a little while and the server responds with new email. So request response is the like foundation of the internet. Whenever you are exchanging information across servers, you are requesting it in one case sometimes, and then the, re the receiver, the other side is responding to you. This back and forth, this interchange is important to us for the rest of the day. Okay, so we can have a conversation, uh, say verbally, where you say you can ask a question, where are you at home like everybody else? How do you have a conversation with Archive Space? 
So you actually have an, a conversation with Archive Space every day because you log in. So you say, hey, Archive Space, here's my request. Let me in. My username and password is the following. So that is a request. Let me in. Grant me access to the staff user interface. Grant me access to my stuff. And then Archive Space, once you pass the correct, by hitting sign in, once you pass the correct re request, Archive Space will get back to you. Sure. That little green message there is Archive Space's response. It's also, it's on the back end or on the, in the API, it is a 200 OK. It means that you provided the correct username and password in your request. And because you did so, I, Archive Space, am granting you access. And then, of course, you get renavigated to your next page. So, request permission to log in. Archive Space responds with permission granted. And then you go about your day. So, let's go about this a little bit more. Let's look at other examples of requests and responses in Archive Space. We just tackled the let me in, here's my username and password. And Archive Space says, okay, I have let you in. Or, if you pass the wrong password, of course, you have all done this by accident, I'm sure, you get refused. And the response then in that case is not a four, it's not a 200 okay, I think it's like a 500, which is no. So once you're in Archive Space and you start doing your work, you're doing your work, you're requesting and responding all the time. So maybe you create this new resource record, you're requesting to Archive Space, create this new resource record for me. Archive Space responses, okay. You see the little green thing up all the time, right? That's creating new data. Maybe you want to make an edit. So save this edited agent record for me. I'm requesting you to do so, Archive Space, by hitting this button. Archive Space thinks about it for a second and it's like, okay. And it gives you another green response. Now, depending on your level of permission, you might have also tried to have this conversation with Archive Space. Hey, Archive Space, let me delete this. But what if you don't have permissions to delete something? Archive space, just like if you pass the wrong password, might give you a no back as your response. No, you don't have the permission to delete this, or whoops, you used the wrong password. You don't have permission to enter. But there's always a response. Even if that response is negative, you have to send information, wait for the response. I am emphasizing this so much because it is the whole rest of our day. <laughs> Another thing to note about using the API, remember I noticed, I mentioned that you're using a staff account. You're using an account in Archive Space to do this. If your account in Archive Space doesn't have permission to delete, say, a uh, top container, then you won't have that permission in the API either. Your permissions persist. So if you are a staff user who doesn't have permission to do something in the archive space user interface, and then you try to do that through the API because you think you're getting around the interface somehow, that is not going to work. Your permissions persist. And so finally, the point of all of this, everything is a conversation. On the net, on the internet, and for our use and purposes today, everything is a conversation in Archive space. Okay. So you don't have to think about any of this when you're in the interface because you're just clicking buttons. The only time that you really care is when you get denied something. When archive space either uh, sends up a message, no, you can't delete this, or uh, record not found because you're having a bad day and the indexer crashed, or whatever the problem is. So you only ever really care about the request response cycle when maybe you're waiting for a page to load, or you've been denied something, and then you start to feel it. You feel you're a little bit more cognizant of it. But otherwise, you're just a 21st century person clicking buttons in a, in a, on a web page. Um, and so we don't feel it. But now one of the things I want you to take away from this converse, like this whole day is I want, now I want you to realize that you are participating in a conversation with a, with a space, even when you're just logged in as a staff user. So I'm cultivating request response mindfulness. Be aware that it's happening, even when you're just a staff user. Okay. Now that you know you're doing it, 
we will learn how to do it through the API. To converse with the API, you need to know how to send what to where. So this is a kind of a, a focus for the rest of our time together. How to send what to where, and we will break down those three things. The first thing we're going to tackle is the where. The where part is what we're going to tackle next. And then after, uh, I'd actually say that right now, I know that we're only a few minutes in, but if anybody would like, let's see, uh, I said I was going to do about a 10 minute break about now. I think that um, I'm going to do a 10 minute break right now and let you contemplate the request response cycle, go check your email, because the next set of things that we talk about, I really like to talk about as one big thing, and I don't want to break up uh, the middle of that. So how we will time that break is I'm going to give put 10 minutes on the clock starting now, and I will pause the recording, which I don't know if I can do, but uh, go ahead, everyone, take a 10 minute break. All right, everyone, welcome back. Okay, so back to our presentation. We left off on how to send what where, and essentially my promise that the where is the part that we're going to tackle next. And so here is where we're about to undertake the first of a uh, foundational shift uh, maybe the first foundational shift is knowing that the Archive Space API uh, gives you the same data that you're used to seeing, but in a different way through uh, JSON, which we saw earlier, and that we're definitely going to return to. The second biggest um, shift that you need to undertake are going to be the next two sections that we do right here. And if you take away nothing from this presentation, the only thing I want you to take away are the next two sections. And then after that, we are going to ramp up and start to look at scripts. And I understand that your comfort level, you know, might fluctuate a little bit after that. But right here, we're going to stay in our probably our comfort zones, but we're going to learn something pretty fundamental, not only about the API, but about archive space itself. And for that, I like to employ the fun metaphor of flipping the ice cream switch, which is a visualization I have used before. So apologies if this is a, <laughs> a duplication of experience you've had before, but it's a really big point. You will see that my subtitle here is reframe how you think about archival data. And so if you are an archivist, uh, you have been, you probably have a pretty, a uh, solid way of thinking about archival data, I am just going to assume that you're used to the hierarchical finding aid. And so um, you might be uh, moving a little bit beyond that into atomized data. But if we if we start with the hierarchical finding aid as sort of the, ba the, the base uh, commonality between us all, that is the thing that I, it's actually my responsibility today to destroy that for you. So <laughs> that is what we're about to do. Okay, so. I use the ice cream cone as a metaphor for the idea that when you order an ice cream cone as a consumer, you are paying for one thing. It is conceptually one thing. We use the singular ice cream cone. It's, and you only pay for one thing when you go to the register and you uh, pay an overpriced amount of, for just a single ice cream cone. This is instinctual to us that an ice cream cone as pictured is one thing, because of course it is. And so what I'm here to do today is to help you flip a switch on thinking of this ice cream cone as being one thing to multiple things. Imagine that you were the owner of the ice cream shop and you needed to fill out your supply orders for the summer. You wouldn't order ice cream cones as conceived of in the prior image. You would order the individual components of an ice cream cone because you are a business owner and you have many different types of ice creams. You would order many different types of waffle cones, the first component of our ice cream cone on the left hand side. You'd order at least two different types of ice cream and then you'd order all of the toppings. Each of these things is a separate component that comes together 
to form an ice cream cone. Okay. <laughs> now we have to think about applying this to archival data. So we think of finding aids, or at least I'll, maybe I'll even just speak for myself. I used to think of a finding aid as a single thing. I actually used to work um, in an institution that still had their paper finding aids up on the shelf. You might still have them. So on paper, a finding aid was a single thing. Even though it was made up of 20 pieces of paper and many different typed lines, we used the singular. It's a finding aid. If you were an institution that then converted those paper finding aids into EAD, maybe you still use EAD files. A single EAD file, even if it is 2,000 line long, 2,000 lines long, is still considered a single file, a single finding aid. You may still conceive of a finding aid this way when you look at it in archive spaces. The staff view, you recognize what is called the tree view of a finding aid. You might still refer to this in the singular. And so I am here today to flip the ice cream switch on the finding aid itself as thinking of it as one thing to multiple things. And I will pause for dramatic effect. If you already mentally do this, great. But if you don't, if you're someone who happens to be in the audience today or watching this video in the future for whom this is a new concept, then this is your most important takeaway today. A finding aid as originally conceived in a database environment. So this was uh, kind of true. This was also true in Archon and Archivist Toolkit, or if you had a homegrown uh, database system. But in a database environment, these different types of records are stored in different tables in different places in the application. And it is only through linking. So these now there's these new lines on the screen. It is only through linking that we bring these things together into a finding aid, a conceptually singular finding aid. So you need to enable your brain to see the multiplicity of a single holding in your database, in your version of archive space. If you have a favorite collection, if you have one that you've personally uh, processed, think of its finding aid in your, in your mind right now. Think of it as being a, a conglomeration of one resource record that is attached to how many different archival objects that is attached to X number of agents, X number of subjects, and then the archival objects themselves are potentially attached to digital objects and top containers. Okay, so uh, this is part of what I have and other times referred to as the evolution of the finding aid. It's a change in thinking from thinking of sort of typed, printed, bound on a shelf finding aids to encoded, rendered as PDF or HTML on the web finding aids. Here's the difference between paper and EAD. So. I've been doing this for 15 years, and so it's almost started in the paper universe, did start in the EAD universe, and now I'm fully ensconced in the database universe, where these are different record types connected back together, and they are atomized, stored in tables in a SQL database. It is the links between the records that maintain their context. And the display and export options of these are limitless because they can be brought together and then fractured apart in different ways, in different formats, however we choose. They can be exported as PDFs, exported as HTML. Well, not directly from archive space, but because things in their smallest pieces can be manipulated uh, more easily than things in giant chunks, and especially things on paper, this is uh, what I refer to as the evolution of the finding aid. And this, along with this change in storage, because what I'm showing you on the screen is really a change in storage. It used to be paper on a shelf, then it was files on a web, and now it is uh, bits of data in a table. Though they are really the story of the different ways of storing this information, something pretty dramatic happened 
between thinking of these things as EAD and now thinking them of them as different records stored in different places in a giant table and a giant uh, SQL database linked together. Along with that change comes a change in thinking that helps you use the API. Okay. Now, back to our request response cycle, flipping this switch, the ice cream switch of thinking of a finding aid as being one thing to thinking of it as being all those different types of records is the precursor we need to take to the where part, going back to our request response cycle of how to send what where. I'm starting on where because this is the biggest uh, fundamental flip to switch. So now that we have flipped the ice cream switch, we're going to talk in detail about the where part of this. So the where are endpoints. If you've heard that term before, um, I'm going I'm to define it sort of either way. If you've never heard this term before, this is a significant term for dealing with the API. The documentation for the Archive Space API is essentially a list of endpoints. It is a list of locations. Endpoints are defined as unique URLs that represent an object or a collection of objects. That's not very helpful, <laughs> so we'll be talking about that together. So back to my metaphor. I'm clicking my slides and they are not proceeding. Okay. If you can train your mind to do this, then the next step is this. I am taking dramatic pauses. If you hear background noises, it's because the sky has just opened up in Maryland and it is raining. <laughs> so I'll go back actually. So maybe you can think of something as being one resource record and three, let's, let's focus on three agents, right? So one resource record is attached. Okay, I'm closing my eyes. One record, one resource record is attached to three agents. Maybe that agent is uh, the creator and two, uh, yeah, three creators of that collection. Can you flip, if, if you get there, can you go one step further and then think of those agents themselves as having three different addresses. What I'm setting up here is this, it's almost like sort of the breadcrumb you navigate when you're um, in your computer. It's like, so you go to like your documents folder slash music slash music from the nineties, and then you find your music. So this is a slash agents slash one. And then the second agent on, attached to your resource record is slash agents slash two. So you need to, uh, the next step here is to make the transition. You've already made the transition to thinking about these things as multiple things, awesome. But now you have to think of those multiple things as then being further represented by endpoints. This is the where. Endpoints are the where. Okay. This is only part of an endpoint. I'm now going to show you an entire endpoint. And here's where we're really getting into the heart of using the API. Here is a fake endpoint. From left to right, this is an essential piece of information for uh, using the Archive Space API. The color coding matters. So I am going to begin to break this down. So here I am breaking it down a little bit further. Now notice the difference between the first and the second line. The beginning of it is the same, localhost 8089. But then notice that uh, repo ID in the first line and ID at the end of the string have been replaced in the second example with real numbers. The reason is, is that the first one with the colon repo underscore ID and then colon ID is an example from the archive space API documentation. The repo ID in italic is a, uh, it's sort of a convention. It means put your repo here. So in the second example, I have actually populated this with a repository number. Say you have three repositories at your institution. Some endpoints require you to say, well, you want me to change a top container, but which repository is that top container in? So my repository is repository two. 
And in this case, I'm talking about a resource record. So it's resources 101. But remember that whenever you're reading documentation, you'll see the first example. And anytime you see that naming convention, you're, it's telling you, it's prompting you, don't just use this string. This string makes no sense. Use this string, but put in the repo ID that it matters to you and put in the resource number that matters to you. Okay. So let's break these down yet further. On the left-hand side, we have the beginning of a, what you would recognize as a, a web address. Maybe if you're used to seeing localhost names. So this is something that, um, remember very earlier, I said, how do you access the API? And I said, you access it via a URL. And then I said, you have to email your hosting provider or your IT person to get what your URL is. But here is where you would put it. So localhost 8089 is, uh, again, a, a convention that says, put your actual URL here. But it is an important, it, it still does break down three pieces of important information. The protocol, which we're not even used to thinking about this because we've just been on the web for so long. No one even ever thinks about HTTP anymore, but it's essentially declaring to the, uh, the web-based API, hey, I'm sending a hypertext protocol request to the following host, insert name of your institution here with your real API address and then to the following port. So navigating the internet using the HTT protocol, go and find name of institution's web hosting server, find port 8089 on that server. And then once you have found that, go find me the second repository and the 101st resource. So I've already talked about the fact that this is the repository number, the green, and resources slash 101 starts to feel a little bit more familiar. Oh, okay. It's a resource record. I actually prefer to read these. Uh, we, we're, we're used to reading uh, left to right, but it's actually easiest, I think, to read these right to left. So from right to left, this says, go find the address of, or so this is the where, right? So this is a location. Go find the 101st resource inside the second repository inside my institution's instance of archive space. And all those th three things together, once you populate these with the pieces of information that matter to you, namely your actual API address as the blue text, you'll probably be keeping repository slash two the same at least some of the time. That's the first repository in archive space. You'll probably be using uh, repositories too. And then what do you care about? Resource records, accession records, top container records because you've split those into different endpoints because you've watched this far in the presentation. Okay, I'm actually going to pause for that uh, a second. Just one second, I'll take a sip of water. Okay. Ah, Marcella asks a good question. Uh, your example is using HTTP. What about when you're dealing with HTTPS? Does that change your interaction with the API at all? And you may be getting into this later. I actually don't talk about that later. Uh, so I will talk about that now. I don't think that it matters. So if your institution happens to use HTTPS, then all that happens is that the protocol goes from being uh, HTTP, just normal, to secure hypertext something, I, I'm actually blanking on what HTTP means. So it shouldn't, I think the answer to Marcella's question is, is that it shouldn't matter as long as you have it right. So as long as you've put the correct thing here, the thing that IT uh, hosting service provider tells you to put here, it should work. However, there is one uh, caveat to that. I have had difficulty using HTTPS through Postman, which is an API client that we're going to be using in our first demonstration. I don't know why. Um, I have never really solved that. So uh, I, I access the API, and we will be talking about this part of it later. So I'll try to do a callback to this. Um, I access the API one of two ways, directly through Python scripts, at which point I have no problem with HTTPS, but I also do it through an interface that I use just for testing called Postman. 
um, like a mailman, postman. And that gives me trouble uh, with HTTPS. And why it does is probably due to just some ignorance on my part. It's probably something that I could figure out, but I admit to get around it, I just turn off um, secure protocols when I'm doing that. I only ever uh, test locally. So for me, there is no consequence to doing it that way. Uh, it's probably just a matter of me doing some Googling to find out why I have trouble with HTTPS. But as long if your institution uses HTTPS, then when you're populating your first endpoint, make sure the S is there and you should be fine. And if I'm wrong about that, um, it, it has, I don't, I've never had a negative experience with using HTTPS other than the one that I just mentioned uh, in my in Postman. Thank you, good question. Okay, so let's move on. Here are some other examples of endpoints. So I focused a lot, uh, I did the kind of really hardcore breakdown of this first one. When you rewatch this presentation, by the way, I think that this is one of those perfect slides that I give onto you to please look at again, because it may help in the future. Here are some other real archive space endpoints. So we started with localhost 8089, repositories resources. I implied earlier that, well, here's the one for accessions. So just look at the color changes to help your eye as I show you these new endpoints. So same thing, go find me the 41st accession record in the second repository in my instance of archive space. Go find me the 51st top container. Now I'm about to show you three more endpoints. They're different than the ones up top. And let me know in the chat if you happen to why they're different. Just give it some thought. I'm not going to pause too long. Does this set off a light bulb for anybody? Why there's a difference between the ones on the top of the screen and the ones on the bottom of the screen? Robin got it. Robin mentioned that they are shared. So agent records, uh, people, uh, personal agent records, locations, and subjects are shared between all repositories. So their endpoints don't have, aren't limited by repositories like the ones up top are. This was a revelation to me when I first uh, started working with the API, that I could start to see the actual structure of archive space represented through its endpoints. When someone asks me a question of, um, is this record shared between repositories? I don't even pause. I go straight to the API documentation, look up its endpoint. And if the if the endpoint has slash repositories in it, my answer is yes, it is, it is uh, it's repo specific. And if it doesn't have repositories in it, my answer is no. That is the that's how I answer the question about whether or not a record type is shared between repositories. Cool. Thanks for that answer, Robin. Here are some more. So, so notice uh, that these are all record types that you're probably used to dealing with. You have created resources, you've created accessions, you've created top containers, agents, locations, and subjects. There are endpoints, though, for things um, that aren't necessarily just an archival record uh, or uh, like a description type. So check these out. Oh, oh, first I wanted to mention um, that you can add on these little uh, extra uh, uh, parameters to a, to a request. So in this case, instead of it being here, let me uh, contrast it to the previous slide. So, so see up here with resources, it says slash ID. I've been implying so far that you can use this to go look at a single resource. In the next one, by putting on all IDs true, I'm not looking at a single resource. I am asking for every resource. So parameters, which are these things that are added at the end of endpoints, can help control one of your responses from archive space. There are also things um, that are true about our descriptive records, but they present different views. So check out this endpoint. Again, it's resources, and it ends in the, in the phrase tree. That means that it's going to show me the tree view of this resource. And I'm, I, have a, a very, I have a whole section on the tree later. You can also access things about archive space that you're used to clicking a button for, like the extent calculator has its own endpoint. 
the config actually has its own endpoint too. You can change enumeration values. Enumeration values are the things that you get in your dropdowns. Uh, so say you were populating an extent and you hit the extent menu you, and you select maybe cubic feet or maybe you use linear feet, but you know that when you're in, your in that menu, you have other options. All of those other options are called uh, enumeration values. You can change the enumeration values through the staff interface, but you can also change them through the API. And jobs. So whenever you create a background job, you are uh, creating, you, you, so you can access um, background jobs, you can create PDF exports, you can get a record of job logs, uh, you can do less, pretty much almost with few exceptions that I can think of off the top of my head, if you can do it in the interface, you can find an endpoint for it. Uh, that might be really overstating it. But if you're ever thinking about a project, really give some time to read through your list of available endpoints because they're not just for the major record types. I use the major record types because they are the most familiar. They are easy to teach, but you can also hit endpoints for functions of archive space or for things about archive space that you uh, are not, not necessarily just a straight view of a record. Okay, so I've mentioned this a few times before. Here's a pro tip on a convention. In documentation, you will see the API referred to as localhost8089. This is a placeholder for insert your API URI here. So I promised you that I was going to show you a real one. So here's a real insert your, <laughs> here's exactly what I would put in place of localhost8089. And what happens when I navigate here? And I actually want to click on this. So this is a link. And when it brings me to Firefox, or when Firefox opens it, this is all I see. This is absolutely accurate. This is what I should see. I cannot, inter I cannot interface with the Archive Space API through a browser, or at least uh, actually there are like browser add-ons and there's different things that you can do. But just because it's a URL uh, doesn't mean that you can really interface with it through your browser. But I'm gonna show you, so when you get your, um, IT person saying, hey, here's your uh, URL, go use this, put it into, into whatever uh, web browser you use, and you should see something that looks exactly like this. It's even confirming for me that Archive Space is running on 2.8.1. So put it in to test it. Uh, I will say that there's one, the reason I can't do anything here is because I need to be able to authenticate. I need to tell Archive Space who I am and that I have permission to be here. But there is information that uh, you don't have to authenticate for. So I'm going to put I think this is going to work. Yeah. So I added the word slash repositories to the end of the API, and I can see that the sandbox right now happens to have this many repositories in it because people are uh, doing stuff. This is cool. The Library of Atlantis. I'm so happy that I happen to have that today. So there is some information that you can access via your browser because it is not behind the authentication of the password. Okay, now moving on back to the presentation. Some things about endpoints. Endpoints change. If you go through the effort of building an entire workflow around an endpoint, and then that endpoint maybe changes or disappears in a future version of archive space, you will have to completely redo your, work, your workflow. So endpoints change. Mainly, they get added. Mainly, there are only more of them. It's good news. It's additive. But remember that every update to archive space might bring changes to endpoints. So for example, this new endpoint that you can see down there, that only applies to archive space 2.8 and later because you couldn't merge. See, it's called carry out a merge request against top container records. And there's the endpoint, slash merge requests slash top container. But you couldn't even merge top containers before 2.8. So this endpoint got added in the documentation for 2.80. But the endpoint documentation itself doesn't tell you that. There's nothing on this screen, if I were to actually go to the where I got this screenshot from, nothing there says, hey, this only applies to 2.8. So you need some pretty 
kind of in-depth knowledge of archive space and the history of archive space, or you're going to, or you're just going to have to suffer the, uh, <laughs> the fate that we've all had of just hitting dead ends and uh, finding endpoints that don't work. So if you're a user in 2.7, you can't use that endpoint, but you can use it in 2.8 and beyond. And points also disappear. So you see that red text at the bottom of that um, up there. It's a get a resource tree. It's actually one of the uh, the endpoints that I just showed you a few slides ago. That big red text says that this endpoint is depreciated and may be removed in a future release of archive space. So they give you plenty of notice um, that it's going away. Um, that, that message has actually been up for a while now and it hasn't actually disappeared yet. But don't build any workflows <laughs> on that on that endpoint because it might disappear one day. So endpoints change. This is something to bear in mind. Now, what you've all been waiting for, demos. <laughs> what I've been waiting for, hooray, where I leave the security of PowerPoint and I go out into the world and I try to do some live demos for you all. And it's just going to feel like a whole bunch of, I don't want it to feel like I tell you to just do one thing and then do it this way instead. And then, you know, isn't the rest obvious and that's it. So hopefully that is not the experience that you are about to uh, have here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do um, our, our first demo is going to be showing you Postman, which I referred to earlier when I was answering that question. Uh, this is this is where to start. So if you are like, what at this point? <laughs> um, what I'm about to show you is where you can start. And then for those of you who may have already had some Postman experience or you've already done this before, very quickly, we are going to accelerate um, and and get into get into stuff that's going to feel like it's beyond the beginner level. So I acknowledge that, uh, but this is this is a complex topic, and so there isn't there's only so much that you can do as you lay the foundations, and then it does get it does get uh, pretty advanced pretty fast. So here we go. Let's go into demonstrations a bit. I'm still in PowerPoint. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the how that we haven't talked about yet. So we still have our how to get what from where. We spent a lot of time on where. Now I'm going to go back and talk about the other two things, how and what. I had to start with where because it had the biggest uh, conceptual shift. And now that you're hopefully comfortable about thinking about endpoints or you're getting there, now we'll go back to the how and the what. So I have uh, two options for how. Any API client or Postman, which is what I'm going to be using in this example. If you don't know what that is yet, don't worry, I'm about to show you. And then scripts, which are written in Python 3. And that'll be where we spend uh, the whole uh, like last quarter of the presentation is we'll be looking at uh, Python scripts. The what is called JSON. I showed it to you way early ago in the one o'clock hour, uh, from one o'clock from my perspective. And we will be talking a little bit about JSON. But right now our main focus is we're going to start with this. We're going to start with Postman, which is an API client. It's going to get us some of this JSON. And we'll come back to the presentation to discuss what JSON is. And we're going to watch these as we go. So watch my endpoints as we go. I'll be talking about them, but eventually I'll stop talking about them because I'll consider them something we've already talked about. But watch them as you go. You're going to see me manipulate our endpoints all throughout the rest of our day together. So talking about an API client in particular, or Postman, uh, Postman is a GUI interface. It's a graphic user interface for working with APIs. It's not the command line. It's more powerful than I realize. I use Postman for like tiny little itsy bitsy things. I'm really using like a race car of, a, of, a, of an application to do my groceries. It is, it is a very powerful application and I only use it for just a few things. I use it for very simple calls. Just, hey, show me a resource, show me a top container. And that's why it's a great place to get started. One of the things that you'll receive at the end is a set of slides that shows you exactly what I am about to do. So don't try to like take any mental pictures about what I'm about to do. Don't worry, you're gonna get a whole PowerPoint, uh, a PDF of an old PowerPoint that I did that uh, will show you what to do, uh, what I'm about to do in order to get some data out of your API for the very first time. Then we're gonna move on to scripts and Python 3. Scripts are the only practical way and that's that's heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, they are a huge barrier entry for most archivists. They were a huge barrier entry for me. I'll be using Python 3 
because it is near universal in the archive space community and Python 2 is depreciated. So don't, uh, I wouldn't use Python 2. Uh, if you already know a scripting language, by the way, use that. But I'm just going to assume you don't uh, for the purposes of a beginner presentation. Today I'm using Jupyter Notebooks. You don't have to know what that means to show you Python. Okay, so no matter whether you use the API client or the scripts, it doesn't matter which of those two things you use, you only need three basic commands to interact with the archive space API. And so that's what this part of the presentation is about, is once you get the where, the endpoint, and once you've gotten your uh, protocol, you need to, so your uh, URI address, I'm sorry, uh, you need to be able to issue three different commands. Get me something, post something, and delete something. These actually have nice corollaries in the interface. Uh, so sorry if I got ahead of myself. Whichever you use, you need these. So forget. Get is the equivalent kind of of clicking view. If you've ever been in archive space and you've clicked view, you are asking, hey archive space, show me this. Go get it for me. Have you ever saved anything in archive space? Of course you have. You are posting, you are pushing information back to archive space. So get is pulling it into you. Posting is pushing it away from you towards the server. And then delete is delete. So I'm not gonna go over delete. Delete just means delete. So getting and posting, uh, pulling data down, looking at it, pushing data back in part of the request response cycle. So, hey, archive space, get me something. That's a request. The response is archive space gives it to you. Hey, archive space, take this. So that sounds less like a request, <laughs> more like a demand, but the post is essentially, it's also a request and a response. Take this from me. And archive space says, okay. And that's the, that's the request and response of a post, of a save. All right, so what we've covered so far, and now I'm about to move into the demonstrations, is that the API shows you the same data, different view. That different view of that data is available via a different route, an endpoint. Working with the API is a conversation. Now, we haven't really covered this so much, but the first conversation is always authentication. It's always, hey, archive space, let me in, because it's a secure system. You can't just see everything. It's not true on the PUI, but it's true with the API if you're looking at your data. It's true with the staff interface. So the first conversation that we always have to have in the request response cycle with the archive space API is let me in. So in this demo, we will introduce Postman, which is this API client that I keep talking about that's relatively easy and simple to use. And then we're gonna mirror two experiences. We're gonna log in and we're gonna authenticate. We're gonna get a record. And then we're gonna edit and post that record back to archive space. So when I say mirror two experiences, I'm actually gonna start in archive space. Ta-da! Remember a while ago I mentioned, depending on how you log in is how you know whether or not you're a local user or not. What I mean by that is if you're using this center screen right here, you are a local user. If you're someone that clicks up, I don't have one here. If you click a button in the upper right-hand corner to log in through say your university or your major institution's authentication method, if you click a button up here, then you are not a local user. Sorry, I don't have a button to show you. I can only show you the absence of a button. So that is again back to if you're using this center screen, because it's in the center now as of, um, I don't remember what version it moved into the center, maybe 2.8. If you're, if you're uh, using this and this little sign in button, you're a local user. So the first thing that happens every day with your cup of coffee in hand is you sign into archive space and you have a request response communication. Hey, let me in. It happened. That is the first thing we're going to do in Postman, too. Okay, let me bring up Postman. Nope, that was PowerPoint. Postman. All right. Now, this is a brand new interface. You've probably never seen this before. So I'll introduce you to it a little bit. 
On the left-hand side, so from here on over, is just a menu for me. I have some saved uh, responses and, and, and things. So over here, uh, you could say I even have a little section for the AS Sandbox, and I have a section called Testing that I actually use for work in my daily life. So we're over here, we're in the API demonstration, and I just have some saved sort of like some pre-baked cakes, like I'm Julia Child. I have some saved things that I can show you. Don't ignore the rest of this. This is a good example of all of the things about Postman that I don't use. It's like mock servers. I don't even know what that means. I, in fact, let me make this a little, yeah, make that a little bigger. I don't ever touch any of this stuff because I have no idea what it means. This is once again, using a race car to uh, pick up your groceries. What I mainly want you to concentrate on is this part of the screen. So everything to the right of, uh, of this part. I actually can't make this any smaller. I've tried, I can make it bigger, but I can't make it any smaller. So this part of the screen, especially when you, oh, if you were to download an open Postman for the first time, you would have um, this part of the screen and you'll have the ability to open a new tab. So look around if you download this and follow my PowerPoint instructions, look around for a new tab because that's what you want. And the, in the first thing you want is a blank new tab. I have a pre-populated tab though, because I'm cheating. So I'm going over here and I'm clicking on authentication. It's the first thing we need to do. So the first thing you need to do when you log in in the, in the morning is you need to post what you're actually doing here. I'll log back out. What you're actually doing here is you're posting your username and password. Remember those three commands, get, post, and delete. You're posting your username and password to archive space by hitting sign in. So in here, I have a menu, which gives me a whole bunch of commands. Again, I don't use any of these. I only use post, which is right here, and get. I don't even use delete because I'm usually not deleting things this way. So here's post. And so you can see how it changes. So I've just changed from a post to get, and now I'm gonna go back to post. So I'm changing, this is the, the direction that this is going. Am I pushing data? posting it or am I getting data in what I'm about to do? So what I do is I post to localhost 8089. You recognize it at this point. I'm using a local install of archive space. So it really is called localhost 8089. I could do this to the sandbox if I wanted to. Slash users. So there's a look, this is us beginning to populate an endpoint. Admin. I am the admin user. So this is where I put my name. If it were um, say something that was more like a like a, uh, a login for your institution, it might be more like vietanese34. So you put your username there and don't worry, you don't have to memorize this. I give you slides for this. I'm just talking it about it out loud. Come back and watch this part of the presentation the first time that you try to do this yourself, but don't feel like you have to like, focus too much in on this right now. I give you all of this to talk about later. So slash users slash admin, Command, uh, login, password equals. I get all of this from the documentation from Archive Space, and you're gonna get all of it from my slides. And here I add my secure password, which is this. If you had a actual proper uh, password that was like great special characters and stuff, that's where you would add your password. You can also see it happening down here where I'm uh, putting my password. And you're like, this is the easy part. She said this was the easy part. Yes, this is the easy part compared to writing a script from scratch if you're not, if you're not familiar with writing a script from scratch. So what I am doing again is I'm posting, posting my password to my endpoint. And my endpoint is the institution where I work slash users slash my own name. So I can't post someone, I couldn't pass my uh, password to someone else's name. Say my colleague's name is, uh, is this. This just happens to be their initials as a user account. That's me trying to pass my password to their account. It doesn't make any sense. I have to pass my password to my own account. And then I hit send and archive space down here see a response, Archive Space is going to give me a response this way. And the response was 200 okay. Remember I mentioned that way earlier? 200 okay is the standard response for successful HTTP requests. So let me bring this up a little bit. 
archive space by doing this has granted me permission to be here. Let me show you what would happen if I put the wrong password. So I'm messing up my password on purpose. Nope, login failed. And I got it. Oh, there it is. It's 403 forbidden. You've probably gotten 403 forbidden messages before. And this is this is it happening in real life. So I am posting my username and password to the archive space API and the API is re is responding with one of two things. You're good to go or nope. So I'll go back, change this back to the real thing and hit send. Now I've gotten back all of this text and it's kind of smushed because I made my screen a little smaller. This is information about me. This is my username. So if you were, you know, your username, this would say your username. It says what my address is. I'm user slash one. I'm user slash one because I'm the only user in my fake archive space, but you might be users 37. This is when my uh, staff account was created. I have been working on this presentation uh, since February 2nd, 25th, which seems about right. So that's when I created my username back, back then. And here are all of my permissions. There's a record of all of the things that I'm allowed to do. Because I'm the admin, I'm allowed to do everything. But if you were not the admin, your list of permissions would be much shorter. In fact, I think that's like literally every permission there is. And then here's some other, yep, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm allowed to do all of these different things. Here's a list of my permissions. So this is a look at my own user record. The most important thing about this though is, I'm gonna go back here. Have you ever noticed that when you sign in, okay, fine, no problem, signed in, you time out after a certain amount of time. Maybe it's an hour, maybe it's four hours. Same for your bank, right? When you log into your bank or your retirement account, uh, the eventually a retirement account is like, we are logging you out for security reasons. Well, the amount of time that passes between when you can log in and when you're kicked out of the server is called session time. Session time begins a clock ticking on you for as soon as you click sign in. If by the way, you are annoyed by the session time for archive space, you can make it longer in the config. So if you do get kicked out after 60 minutes and that's too short, uh, set, ask someone to set it for longer. And that's a whole different presentation, but that's a pro tip in case that annoys you. So, oops, I've lost my, this is gonna start to happen more as I navigate more windows. Here is a word called session, and here is a long alphanumeric key. This is how, archives, how the Archive Space API manages the amount of time and my level of permission. This unique string of numbers and letters will now be part of my afternoon because every time that I then go to get more information from archive space, I don't authenticate every single time. What I do is I pass this session key in with my request. That session key tells the archive space, it tells the API two things. How much time is left on my session because eventually this string of uh, letters and numbers will expire. If it were set to the default, it would expire 60 minutes from now. I have set it crazy long because I'm teaching today. It also tells Archive Space what permissions I have. So I'm going to copy this. And now I'm going to go get something. So Let's go back to archive space because I'd like to parallel these two experiences. So I'm going to go back to archive space. I'm going to grab, when I go to resources, you're going to see there's very little in here. It's only two things. Here's the Morris Canal Canal uh, collection, and I'm going to click on that. Actually, no, I'll click on Tiny the Cow Papers. It's named after my cat. Oh, wait, no. I used that for testing something recently. So let me do this instead. Okay. So, um, here's our fake collection, by the way. We're, we're going to get to know it a little bit better later. So here's the Morris Canal collection. Notice up here that it's, uh, let's see if it can make that bigger. Actually, I can't make the address bar bigger. I'm sorry about that. But up here it says resources slash one. Again, I'm, coming, I'm calling back to endpoints. So I'm going to edit. And I'm going to uh, ruin the title of the Morris Canal collection company papers by putting a whole bunch of X's. So what I just did was I made a get to the server, get me the Morris Canal Company papers. And then I made a change and I saved it and I posted it back. Remember I'm cultivating request response mindfulness. Now I'm gonna do this exact same thing in the API. 
So back to Postman. I'm switching over to a get request instead. I'm getting something and I already have this populated to help me out. Get from localhost8089 repository 101. Uh, I think the repository 101 part is because I'm using the local Apache database. I'm not sure why it names that 101 instead of two resources one. So that looks good, right? Send. Up oh, session gone. I haven't given the API the information I promised it that I just said. I need to pass my session key each and every time that I make a request. So let me go back here and show you under headers that this is where you declare the session. And once again, you're like, oh my God, she's moving really fast. How am I supposed to remember this? I have slides for you. Soon, if you practice, this will happen instantly for you. You'll know these steps. So what am I doing here? See how this is called headers? Header, in this case, is a piece of information that I am passing at the top or the leading edge of my request that says, hey, remember me? I just authenticated five minutes ago. I have permission to do all these things. Could you go get me this resource? And by passing the session with my response as a header, I prove to Archive Space that I'm allowed to be here. And so here, and now this can just stay here, by the way. I don't have to paste it every time. I have pasted it the one time. You can also configure Postman, by the way, to auto-populate all of this, but that isn't good teaching. Good teaching, unfortunately, is highly, highly manually, <laughs> where I show you me literally grabbing it. I'm grabbing, by the way, what's between the quotes, not the quotes themselves. And then I put it in the header of my next request with this key. This is all things that, yes, is documented in the API documentation, but not very clearly. You'll have my slides to do this. So now I have gotten live because you just saw me change all these X's. The Morris Canal collection. Here, there are the three subjects. Let's go see if that's that has to be true, right? So let's go see. Yep, there are three subjects attached to this record. There are some notes, got an abstract, an access note, an immediate source of acquisition. As we scroll through my record, I know I'm going to see those too. Oh, here's my extent. It's in linear feet. Here's my lang materials. I'll keep scrolling until I find those notes. Here are my dates from 1880 to 1930, the approximate uh, span dates of the life of the Morris Canal Company itself. Here are those three subjects. And here are my notes. Abstract, and then blah, 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 the Morris Canal Company consists of photographs and business records. Here's my next note, my access restrict note. Access to the collection is unrestricted. And as I go down, you are seeing every part of my resource record. Here's the biokiss note, the biggest one. Here's my uh, preferred citation. Don't cite fake collections and sample repos. Great. So this entire thing from this curly bracket all the way back up to this curly bracket is a JSON record of the resource level, only the resource, no archival objects associated here, no series or anything. And why is that? Because an, a finding aid is made up of multiple record types linked together. So if I wanted the photograph series, I would have to hit another endpoint for it. I would have to go find it via the archival objects endpoint. And you can see that happen up here. See resources slash one, watch my address bar change. When I navigate here, I'm on archival object one now. Okay, so let's make a change 
to the Morris Canal Company papers. And to do this, I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit. I know that you're losing the ability to see the detail here, but you're watching now me uh, work in this application as a whole. It's just too much information to work that small. So there's a little button over here that lets me copy the whole thing. I copied this entire response, all of it. And now I'm going to change this from a get to a post. And I am going to post the whole thing. So if you rewatch this video, you're going to notice that I clicked over onto body and I clicked onto raw. I'm going to paste the entire record back, the whole thing. And then I'm going to get rid of my X's. There's a reason I chose, uh, there's a reason I uh, did the entire record. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, so there's our Morris Canal Company collection with no X's, and I'm going to send it back. And down here, I got another 200 okay, updated. I got it from the single endpoint, changed it, sent it back to the same endpoint, and updated it. And so very slowly and manually did I do those things. And you're like, oh my goodness, this is not efficient at all. Where's all the efficiency? This is just to show you how it's done. Now, when I go back to archive space, and I use this, by the way, for testing only. I use Postman to test my assumptions before I bother to write a script. So you can probably already guess that when I click here and I refresh the page, my X's are gone. I have changed this resource record through the API by getting it down, making a change, and then posting it back to the same endpoint that I got it from. It was slow and manual, and you're like, that whole authentication and session part was terrible, and I agree with you on that, but I'm showing you how to do it the slow and manual way. Okay, so it's about three o'clock. And what happens next? Okay, I'm going to do one more thing, and then we're going to take a break. And then we're really going to get into pretty powerful, uh, fast-paced, well, not so much fast-paced, we're going to get into some powerful uh, Python examples. And you'll see me handle that authentication thing with just a few lines of Python, instead of the <laughs> terrible experience of copying and pasting this, and then like finding where it goes over here and like putting it here. So even though I think Postman is actually pretty easy because you don't have to learn how to script in order to use it, um, I only use this for basic, basic testing. And then I do my real work, my actual, hey, let's go change a thousand records. I do that in Python. All right, so really quickly before our break, let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation to talk about one important thing. I'm getting oriented here, hold on. Uh, and that is, nope, not that. I just added a slide by accident. JSON, that thing, that, that language looking thing that you just saw me working with. And you've heard me refer to it now a few different times. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. You do not need to know that. Here is the really good news. JSON is the easiest part about all that we are talking about. The biggest controversy with, with JSON is whether or not you pronounce it as JSON or JSON, which you will get into fights at conferences about. So let me tell you a bit about JSON. Remember, this is not scary. This is probably one of the easiest things that we will face uh, for the rest of the day. So remember I said that we were going to start with this and we were going to get some of this. So what we got through Postman and what we'll get through uh, Python is always going to be JSON. That's not true for all APIs, by the way. Remember I said that Archive Space is one of a billion APIs. Some APIs give you back XML. Some give you back HTML. Archive Space gives you back JSON. Um, and actually some other, some applications will let you choose what you want to get out of it. Um, I did some work with the, um, one of the APIs from the Library of Congress that gets you access to the uh, the Newspapers Project, the really awesome, the American Newspapers Project, and you could ask for your output from that in um, in anything, I think, like XML, Dublin Core, anything. So it is the Archive Space API that deals, I believe, only in JSON. So when you go out into the grander universe of APIs, you will find that APIs will give you back other uh, formats. Okay, so 
It is a data interchange format. All that means it is a perfect, great format for passing information back and forth. It is how a lot of APIs talk to each other. APIs push out JSON, and then the other API on the other side that's listening pulls it in. It's very human readable, which is why I think it is one of the least scary things. It is made up of key value pairs. This is really what they're called. The information on the left is referred to as a key. The information on the right is referred to as a value. JSON has arrays, and we'll actually look at one of them uh, in detail in a minute. So for those of you who may be used to EAD or XML, I have an example for you. Here is the name, the Morris Canal Company Papers, encoded in XML. We declare on the left-hand side that, what well, really think about what encoding is, is that it's uh, giving more information to information. So Morris Canal Company Papers is information, but what type of information is it? It is a unit title. So by wrapping Morris Canal Company Papers in the element of unit title, we are adding additional meaning and additional readability, say, to a style sheet or a computer as to what this piece of information is. We encode um, an XML with two with elements. So we wrap elements around information, and then we bring more meaning to that uh, information. JSON is the same, is similar. But instead of wrapping it around the text like this, I actually argue it's more readable because we make a declarative statement on the left, and then the rest of the information follows on the right. I'll just pause there for a second, especially if you're used to XML, and because I desperately need a sip of water. Okay, so that's simple information, just a title. Now, what about something a little bit more complicated? So again, if you're used to EAD, I worked in EAD for 10 years, you'll see the example at the top is an Archdesk. And within the Archdesk, we have two pieces of information now, a biochist and a scope and content note. So my point here is that there is a, uh, a single section of a document, a bigger, broader section of a document, the archival description section of this document. And then within it, hierarchically or nested, uh, not hierarchically, but nested within this bigger section, there are two additional uh, things. These are notes. So the arch desk is where we put notes in EAD. And here's two different types of notes. The biographical statement, which begins the Morris Canal Banking Company was founded in 1824. And then the scope and content note, which begins the collection consists of. So two pieces of similar information nested together under a larger element that declares something about this entire section of our document. And now, of course, you're going to see the equivalent of that on the lower half. This is exactly how those two things would appear in a JSON array. So the notes there declared on the left hand side is similar to the Archdesk in that it is saying all that follows here is Archdesk, all that follows here are notes. And then nested within the notes really elements of a list instead of being nested elements in XML, are two discrete uh, list items. The first is the biographical note, and the second is the scope and content note. OK. And so that is all I have to say on JSON, because I genuinely think that because it is so human readable, that while it might not be familiar to you, it's only going to take, hmm, 30 minutes of really reading a whole lot of dry JSON text before you start to see things like this come out, especially since you already know your data. If you pick a finding aid in particular or a resource record with its associated archival objects that you know very well, and you're reading JSON, maybe that you yourself even wrote. So if you wrote or if you processed a particular, that's why I always say start with a collection that you processed because you know it very well, or start with one that you have to do a lot of reference on or whatever it is, pick a collection that you know very well, and then start to get 
the records of it out of the API and you won't need to know JSON, you'll see your data and the patterns there will make sense to you. It'll start to come out at you. It's inherently human readable. All right, so I sort of promised to break and we're at three o'clock and we're about to kind of uh, do a big leap here. <laughs> it's truly a big leap and it's a bit of a scary one. So how about we take a, yeah, about a 15, I'll do another 10 minute break uh, right now. So let me leave the slides behind and let's do a 10 minute break and I will uh, pause the presentation again. So 10 minutes, go for it. All right, everyone, welcome back. All right, so keeping an eye on that clock. Here we go. And now the big leap. So I hope up until this point, you've felt relatively comfortable. I know that maybe going in and out of Postman, uh, all of it's like something that was like, all of us, oh, she's moving very quickly, uh, may have not been so comfortable. But now if you have been comfortable up until this point, you may not feel comfortable from here on out. And I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge that fact. Uh, the reason is, is because we are about to talk about scripting. And you may feel the way I felt about this, that uh, this was not in my wheelhouse. I had no formal education to this point, and it was not exactly why I got into this field. So it is a big leap. Uh, the difference between where I am now and where I was five years ago took five years, first of all, <laughs> and um, it took a lot of self-doubt and some, some, where do I go for resources on this? And why is this so hard? And why is there really no way to learn this? And it's because all of us would sort of have to hit the pause button on what we already know. Some of you may already know scripting and go pursue an entirely different way of thinking. So it is a big leap. If you don't feel uh, comfortable or like you're fully following along for the rest of the presentation, I apologize, but I also sympathize. I did not feel that way myself. And knowing that I actually even wrote these slides is crazy to me. I would like to remind you though, that this is a resource. It's not just today. This isn't just your afternoon today. I hope that this presentation is a long-term resource, something that you can return to because you'll say, hey, I remember when Valerie showed me that thing. You can go back to this presentation when you do feel more comfortable or when these concepts are a little bit easier to parse and rewatch what I do, and then you'll be right, right there alongside with me. Okay, so what I can't do today in terms of scripting at least is, oh, and what I can do. So I cannot teach you scripting fundamentals. I can't teach you Python fundamentals, and I cannot help you set up a dev environment. Setting up a dev environment, that very last one there, is one of the major reasons why I don't suggest that the introduction to our to the Archive Space API be done as an interactive website because uh, or an interactive workshop because setting up a dev environment on your computer means that it is not a universal experience. You would each have fifty different laptops to set up a dev environment on, and it would take half the day to do just that. So. Uh, one of the reasons I recommend in my API playbook that you actually take some Python classes is because it is the first step of any Python class to set up a dev environment on your local machine. What I can do today is, though I am focusing on scripts, I will focus on archive space specific things. So maybe I can't teach you Python, but if and when you learn some Python or you become more familiar with it, what the the, so let me put it this way, YouTube <laughs> and the whole world can teach you Python, but I can teach you once you learn Python, how to focus on a space specific authentication, linking, and I'm going to do an example walkthrough. This is the part where I talk to you about, so I said that, you know, a archive spaces and API, you can find resources on APIs. That's true. So the world can teach you about Python. The world can teach you about APIs, but I'd like to think that what I bring to the table is another archivist talking about archival representation of data through JSON in an archival specific database. And so if you can come back to this presentation 
knowing a little bit more about scripting Python and having a set up a dev environment, that is when the knowledge of what is specific about archive space that matters to you will matter to you. And then of course, after this, I will be suggesting your ne exact next steps. I will be giving you my playbook and I will be giving you some scripts. I'd also like to remind you that I really didn't want to do this. So some of you actually might be watching this and saying, no, I'm totally excited about this. I can't wait for this part of my career to get started. That is so great. But if there's someone in the audience who doesn't feel that way, just know that I didn't, I wasn't excited about this either. But now that I do it, it has completely changed how I work, what I do, and how efficient I can be. All right, so here we go. Let's start talking about scripting. What is potentially your biggest hurdle? I will be specifically using Python. You do not have to specifically use Python, but I would like to let you know that almost everybody that I communicate with in the archive space universe is using Python. Okay, so you may have watched this presentation already knowing what I'm about to say, which is that scripting is the only practical way to use the API. And as I've already said, this stopped me in my tracks for about three years and was not at all what I thought I was signing up for. So let's rewind a bit and say, well, why do you need scripts? Because you can only do one thing at a time, either in the interface or in the API. So when you're in the interface, you're only working on one resource record at a time. You're only creating one top container at a time. I know that you can create the bulk, uh, bulk exports, and, uh, you know, sort of like the bulk, bulk processes. You can use the spreadsheet importer, but essentially, actually all the spreadsheet importer is is, all, is a series of API hits. Um, the, real, the underlying reality under this, the, the, the thing that isn't so nitpicky is the next the next fact, which is you can only hit one endpoint at a time. So even the spreadsheet importer, even the uh, bulk barcoder, all of those things that are bulk actions in archive space are still only hitting one endpoint at a time. That's the reality. So we make what computers, we make computers do what we do just faster. The spreadsheet importer just hits the API faster. So a script can only do one thing at a time too but really fast. How fast do you say? I happen to have a GIF of me running a script. This is me creating um, container profiles. And you can see that I create, I think it's something like 70 creator profiles. Let's see, it starts at ID 56 and it goes to ID 89. That's how many uh, were created in just that amount of time. So really fast. So the API itself, isn't a magical thing that makes all of these awesome API projects happen. It's the scripts that makes things happen. And it's just the API that makes the using the scripts possible. So we didn't do this in the past, for example, against Archivist Toolkit because Archivist Toolkit didn't have an API, but you could have written a script that could have corrected data. You've probably found other ways to do this in the past, like maybe exporting everything to EAD and doing it there. So this is the first time at least in my experience, my personal experience, where the database that we are using as a community has the ability to do this, although shout out to SQL, which I'll come back to in the end. So in the end, we all need an introduction to scripting and an introduction to the API, and you're only getting one of those two things today. So we're back to the how to get what from where. We've started with uh, the how part being Postman and now we're using Python. So the, the what and the where stay the same. It's still JSON and it's still endpoints, but now it comes down to the how. First, we did it manually, painfully manually uh, through Postman. And now we're gonna be doing it uh, not so painfully through uh, with, with uh, Python 3. So the point is we're still gonna be getting JSON and we're still gonna be watching the endpoints as we go. Uh, this is sort of a repeat slide from earlier. Python 3, the only practical way, huge barrier. Uh, I think I did could have just deleted that slide, not even bothered. <laughs> All right, so scripts do what you do just much faster. Since my work focuses a lot on data cleanup and data mapping, that's what these demos lean towards. Um, and that is a, a kind of a, a blind spot for me. If you want to do other things, I don't have as much experience with other things. For example, if you're looking to create system integrations, I have no direct experience with that. Having two APIs talk to each other, I can talk my way through it because I probably know something, 
but I've never done it myself. I've never written the code that makes two systems uh, talk to one another. So what we've covered so far is uh, the API shows you the same data, different view. Different view is available during a different endpoint. Working with the API is a conversation and the first conversation is always authentication. These are exact same things that we just talked about. It's just that this time we're gonna do it through Python. So we're gonna, I'm gonna first introduce uh, what a Jupyter Notebook is for demonstrating scripts. And then I'm gonna mirror what we just did in Python. Uh, I mean, in Postman, we're gonna log in and authenticate again. We're gonna get a record again and we're gonna edit and post that record back to archive space. And then we're gonna go do some crazy things with scripts. So I acknowledge again that you might go from being like, okay, I'm following to not following. Just hold on true. All right, here we go. I'm nervous about this part. Okay, so. What you're looking at, uh, you don't really have to worry about is an interface uh, for me to bring up some Jupyter notebooks. So first of all, what is a Jupyter Notebook. This is what you're going to be. So you, we've been in PowerPoint together the whole day and you've become familiar with like my PowerPoint slides and stuff. Now you're going to have to get familiar with this interface instead. So you're going to see me in this page and you're going to see me bring up slides that look like this instead. So this is where we're spending uh, pretty much the rest of our time together today. So what Jupyter Notebooks are is really cool. They are a live coding kind of, they're like, I don't even know what they are. They're so awesome. They allow me to run Python live in front of you in a web-based interface that is much smoother than me showing you like the command line and uh, text editor and everything. So you see the line right here, print. Jupyter Notebooks are a fantastic learning tool. This is a single humble line of Python. And when I run this you see how it um, has actually done what I told it to do. So for those of you who are used to the command line, this is like the terminal printing out directly below uh, the command that you just issued. But for a, turn, uh, for a teaching tool, what this allows me to do is show you raw script on the upper half of this very tiny slide, and then the result of my raw script on the bottom. So I'm just getting you used to what a Jupyter Notebook is. So in my next slide, I'll show you how this is really happening in live, it's happening right now. So you probably know what five times two is. I'll pause and actually let you look at that. That's just a line of Python because Python is at its heart, what all, what all scripting languages are is just math. Uh, so x equals x equals five, y equals two, what, what is z going to be? And you can see how I get to manipulate this in real time. So if I change these two numbers to something that I would never be able to do the multiplication on to prove to you that I'm doing this in real time. So that's what's really cool about this. I'm just introducing uh, what a Python, uh, what a Jupyter Notebook is. So everything I'm about to do today against the API is going to be live. And finally, I want to point out um, concatenation and variables. So read what I have on, even though it's Python, you'll find that you're going to be able to read it read what I have on the screen. While I said I can't really talk about scripting fundamentals, this is a scripting fundamental. The idea that you can declare a variable and then combine those variables later on as different things. This is something you're going to watch me, you're going to see today. So all of a sudden, my scripts are going to get really complicated looking. And one of the things at least I can explain to you is when I'm using variables like this. So you may have already guessed what this is going to print as. There you go. So that's a very basic introduction to just the learning experience from here on out. Now I'm going to leave these introduction slides behind. And we're actually going to get started. Here we go. We are going to talk about authenticating, but now through Python. We're gonna talk about libraries, which are kind of Python modules. We're gonna talk about session keys. So remember that alphanumeric string that I showed you earlier in Postman that proves to archive space who I am. And then we're gonna do a sample get. We're gonna get the poor old Morris Canal Company papers out for like the third or fourth time. So let's review authentication. Authentication consists of sending ArchivesSpace a username and password. 
and receiving a, a session key in return. Any interaction with the API after the initial authentication must, must then include that session key in the header until the session expires. Those words should seem familiar from earlier. These slides discuss authenticating and then storing and sending the session key when using Python. So remember I said I can't teach you Python fundamentals, but I can teach you how to authenticate to the Archive Space API. So once you know hopefully a little bit of Python, come back, watch these slides. So in order to, in order to authenticate with Postman, we posted our password to the user endpoint. So here I am again is my admin, it's my user endpoint, and we used our password as the parameter, my secure password. So this assumes the following variables. And so now we're gonna break these things out into variables. My base URL is localhost. Your base URL is insert name of your institution, whatever, your actual API address. Your actual username, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Your actual username and your actual secure password. Remember, don't test against production. <laughs> I should have said that about a million times by now. Please put instead there not your production URL, but maybe a sandbox URL or the archive space sandbox URL or a local install of archive space. Okay, so in real life, you may be using a base URL that's not the default. So instead of base URL equals localhost 8089, you might have one that looks like the other two, sandbox.archivespace.org or my fake hogwarts-archives-api. Also in real life, you'll be using an archive space staff account. I recommend creating one just for the API, like API user. So that way, when you're looking through archive space and you see that a change has been made, you see that the API made the change, not uh, you, the individual clicking with buttons. So but then there's a fake password, you know, a more secure multi different type of password. So in which case, this would be your user endpoint. So here I put API user where admin had been. And now, of course, my password is this password, not secure password. OK. So now we're actually going to authenticate in Python using what something that's called the requests library. And that capital R is a capital R not because it's a title slide, but because it's actually the name of something that I'm using. So what's a Python library? It's a collection of built-in modules. Simply put, there's some of the tools in your Python toolbox. If you're a plumber, you use different tools than a carpenter and vice versa. So if you're someone interested in a RESTful web API that's sending and receiving JSON, which is you now, you'll be using different Python libraries than a programming working with mathematical data sets or XML. So requests is one of the libraries I wanna draw your attention to early because you will probably use it one day. Here are some libraries that I use all the time. I use requests, which is for handling the request and response cycle that I've been referring to this whole time. Requesting and pushing information is the job of that library. I then parse JSON data. So I have a JSON library called JSON. And then sometimes I'm working with CSVs or spreadsheets. So I also have a JSON library called CSV. I use these three all the time. I still use uh, spreadsheets for everything, despite it being 2021. I'm proud of it, I'm fine. I'm confident. And here are some libraries I use occasionally, but that you might be interested in knowing about. PyMark for working with Mark 21 in Python. Did I just blow your mind? So if you ever have occasion to use Mark 21, you there is a Python library for that. SQL Alchemy is for working with SQL. LXML is for working with XML when I have to work directly in EAD. And then you may have heard of ArchiveSnake. It is a Python library specific to ArchiveSpace. It is, though, in my opinion, an intermediate to advanced topic, and I am not teaching it today. ArchiveSnake is a Python library specifically designed for the ArchiveSpace API. Though I have an ArchiveSnake example today, I'm not using it. And honestly, I'm going to skip this paragraph. Essentially, why not? I think it, as a beginner's presentation, it's easier to deal with the requests library than it is to deal with ArchiveSnake. So here is some real Python. This is real Python. This is how I authenticate to the Archive Space API. And you're gonna see some familiar things. Here is that endpoint you have already seen now multiple times where it's my admin and my secure password. 
And here is that X dash archive space session thing you may have noticed when I was in Postman and storing my session header. These, uh, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, these few lines of code pass my username and password to archive space and receive back my session key. And these lines handle the annoying part of authenticating manually through archive space. So watch this. Remember when I did that in Postman, the first thing I got back was my session. So I just posted my username and password to the archive to the uh, authentication API endpoint and got back the exact same return that I got in Postman. But I did it with these three, with these uh, little, these few lines, so that I don't have to do it manually. And don't worry, you'll be getting plenty of scripts. And at the top of each script, so say you get like uh, three or four scripts for me, at the um, ultimately you'll see that these lines are at the top of every single one of those because the same thing has to happen at the beginning of every script. You always have to authenticate. So you'll see that these lines repeat throughout our entire rest of our afternoon together. And now I'm going to prove to myself that I got my session key. So your session key is, and then it prints for me, the alphanumeric string that I just got there. Now I'm going to be using this string for the rest of these slides to continue to prove to archive space who I am. Now, once again, back to my example to Fred Rogers, where I uh, parsed out two different variables and then brought them back together. Usually when you authenticate, you do that by parsing out your uh, information. So instead of actually using the long string HTTP localhost 8089, you declare a variable base URL, just the same way I did first name for Fred Rogers. And then here again, see, instead of admin, I just declare myself a user. And for secure password management, I don't actually put my real password, I just declare a variable password. So to show you that in action, here's now this version where up here, I declare who I all, all my kind of base information. And then I call that information down back here. So for the rest of our time, this is really how I authenticate. I don't uh, hardcore hard write out the endpoint each time it wouldn't, it's impractical to do so. So say you're working with a colleague, they could change their username to their name, and their password to their password. So this is going to happen, this is going to work for me again because it's just the same lines that I did earlier, but in a slightly uh, kind of neater, neater way. Okay, now I'm going to show you very briefly, it's a teaser, I know, how to authenticate in Python with Archive Snake Python client. These are the same lines of authentication that I just, these will accomplish the exact same thing. Now your session key is this. This is how authentication looks in, Arc, in, uh, in a snake. Okay, now I'm going to use the requests module to get the Morris Canal Company records resource record. And I have to store and send the session key in order to do that. So here, down here in headers, is where my script stores my session key for me. You will get these lines. And so you can just take my lines and put them at the top of your script, whatever their first script that you ever write. And then all you have to do is change this and this and this and this to be what applies to you. But then you will have the ability to store and send your session key just by using these lines. And they happen instantly at the top of each one of your scripts. Now, for the first time, I'm actually going and getting something. So I'm using the requests library to get resources one. And I'm including in my request, my header. My header has my session key stored in it. You will also get these exact lines and then I'll print what I get. There is the Morris Canal collection uh, JSON record, which we know is at repositories. And then remember the repository is being handled by a variable, but it's resource one. And I was able to prove to archive space that I'm allowed to get that information because when I posted, when I, when I issued my get, I also passed my header, which had my session key in it. And you'll get lines that look just like this. And then you can take them home and you can change uh, resources to accessions. 
do that right now. What happens if I change resources to accessions? Oh, I got an accession. All of my, accession, my fake accessions are just called accession one, the memories of those that came before us. This is based on a real story stored in a barn, possible chicken poop. So I uh, can just change, you can experiment with um, the contamination concerns. Yeah, try dealing with that in the reading room. So there's our first accession. I can also change it to the like fifth accession, which is accession five. And so once you get these scripts and you have a Python development environment, which I admit is not something I'm showing you today because it's kind of impossible to do that for 50 people. <laughs> um, it is something that you'll be able to just use these scripts to do. And I'm gonna get the other collection. So all I've done here is that I've changed my uh, resource number and here's the tiny the cow papers, which is my other fake resource record. So these slides dealt only with authentication. So you see this big block at the end this is what you're going to get. It's the final script altogether. And I give you some tips here. I say what to do with it. And then this is what you'll get. You'll get from here up, well, you'll get the whole thing. And then you can change this information. And if you run it and change the endpoint down here, you can get the first resource in your first repository. So that's an example of one of the things that you'll be getting. So you'll get all of the authentication and the session stuff. And then I suggest reverse engineering why it works. So instead of telling you, you have to just open a blank text editor and start writing Python. Instead, I'm gonna give you Python and then recommend that your education, if you decide to, to pursue this from here on out is to take what I give you and reverse engineer, well, why does it work? And it's an easier way to learn, in my opinion, Python than starting from truly from scratch. All right. Now I have some pretty substantial examples and I'm running a little low on time. So I might go a little bit faster than I had really hoped to do today. So let me move on. Now I'm going to get and post. I'm gonna recreate that Postman example that we did earlier where I brought down the collection, made a change and posted back. So these, you were gonna see this at the top of every screen of every script because I always have to authenticate first. So I'm just gonna start to eventually not even like mention it, I'm just gonna do it. So I need to run uh, this right here and that should have worked. And now what I'm doing is I'm playing around with uh, changing my endpoint. So here's my endpoint, it's repository slash repository. And then I put record type in as a variable. So I have resources up here. So let's watch what happens. This endpoint will get Repositories 101 Resources 1. Cool. So let's make it work for us. There it is. This is a little squished uh, to make it fit on the screen, but here's the Morris Canal collection. So let me change uh, resources to accession again. Okay, this endpoint will get accession 1. We already saw that that worked. Oh, what happened? Did I misspell my session? That should have worked. Oh, maybe it's plural. No. Oh my goodness. That should have worked. That's very confusing. Let me go back to just using resources because we knew that worked. Okay, we're back to, yes, we're back to something successful. I won't bother trying to uh, change the endpoint then. Okay, so nope. Now all sorts of stuff's going crazy wrong. All right, here we go. Let's go back to where we were. All right, instead, we will get an accession. We will get a resource. So here is the Morse Canal collection. Once again, I'm going to copy literally the entire thing and now I'm about to show you why copying the whole thing matters. Why any time that you are working in the archive space API, you should use the whole string. So I'm gonna paste back this string right here and I'm gonna make that weird change again where I add a whole bunch of, this time I'll add a whole bunch of Ks to Morris Canal collection. 
if I post that back in, so here I've now I've changed it to requests.post, where up until this point it had been requests.get. This is how I flip back and forth between these two commands. If I made requests.delete, I guess I could just delete this, but I'm not going to. I want to show you something else. Okay, so let's go back. Here's uh, archive space. Do you see how I have it? The, the identifier is MSS MC001. I'm going to go back and here is MSS MC001. I'm going to make a very subtle point about why it matters that you paste back the entire record. If I were to paste back only part of this record, let's make sure that was successful. Okay, I have updated the Morris Canal collection with all the Ks. But yes, so cool. This, this record has been updated by another user. So I will uh, save it. Here are all my Ks but I'm missing my 001. If you post back a record without all of the record, without all of the information that you got the first time, archive space will overwrite your record with a blank. This is something I didn't realize at first. I thought that if I'm only adding new information, it would only add the new information and it would retain the old information. But I just deleted that 001 from this record. There's no getting it back. It's gone. So when you are working with the API, it is really important to be working with the entirety of a record. If you are editing records, if you're posting new records, there's nothing to overwrite because it's new data. But if you are ex uh, cleaning up existing information, make sure that you are using the entire record because whatever you leave off, unless you want to do it that way, unless you purposefully are trying to get rid of information, you will post back blank. And so I have deleted my third ID and there's no getting it back. So that's an example uh, with, with JSON, with, a, with this of how I did that. I'm actually gonna skip that. And this is a block actually that says, this sample script is not really recommended for use. So you're not going to get the script that I just created because it's a teaching script. It is completely impractical to manually copy and paste an entire JSON record like I just did and then post it back. Don't do that. I just wanted to show you that it is possible. I just really wanted to show you the difference between requests post. I'm sorry, let's go back and do, here's where I got the information, requests get base URL endpoint with my headers that got me the Morris Canal Company collection. And then it's almost, it's the exact same endpoint, except that I change get to post, just like you do uh, in Postman. When I switch from here, from get to post, I don't touch this. I didn't touch that earlier. I just used the different, different dropdown menus. Okay. Now, let me show you some scripts that actually become a little bit more practical. So these are the ones where I'm starting to move away from just demonstrating things to giving you scripts that I think are significant to you. So this is another one where you might actually use this. Uh, you might actually use you you might actually use the authentication uh, scripts, which I, I showed you two scripts one and a half scripts ago. And then this is one where this is a script you're going to get and that you can save and use in your real life. This one you might really want. So. I'm also going to start exploring uh, repo specific endpoints and saving of response. So, so far we've only been looking at responses in real time. They are ephemeral. As soon as I close Postman, they're gone. Or as soon as I close this web browser, they're gone. So here I'm actually going to give you a script where you can save that JSON to your computer. You can save it locally and you can retain a copy of a particular type of record. I'm not even going to bother to talk about it. These are the authentication slides. I just always have to do it at the top of every slide. Okay, so now here we are declaring a record type as resources. That record type variable gets plopped into our endpoint right here. So the endpoint is slash repositories slash repository number slash record type, which is declared right there. So this is going to read 
repositories slash repository 101, because that was declared uh, higher up in the script, resources, and then here's that all IDs true parameter. I'm about to get every resource, not just one. And this is going to start to become more practical for real projects. You don't, you probably don't want to just correct one thing. You'd go into the staff interface and correct one thing. You might want to correct or update thousands of things. And so here is how I get all of them out. Unfortunately, in my fake repository, I only have two things, so it won't be that dramatic. So this endpoint will gather, gather every ID for resources by hitting the following endpoint. And this endpoint has been concatenated from the information that we provided it above. So if I were to change this to accessions, although boy, accessions didn't work earlier. Very confusing. Uh, this will gather every ID for accessions. Okay, so what happens next? Here it is. This is the test endpoint. And I am going to run it. There are 18 records of the requested type in this repo, and here are their IDs. So if you had a really big, robust resource, let's say you have like 2,000 uh, resource records or 2,000 accession records, there would be 2,000 records of the requested type in this repo, and you get a really long list of their IDs. And what I'd like to do now is I'm going to save. So this is another one of these scripts that you are going to receive. What I'm going to do is I still can only hit one endpoint at a time. So what this for loop does, and this is where learning Python is your next goal, for every ID in the list of IDs, one, two, three, four, five, go get the record and append it to a giant record. So go get record one, save it temporarily. Go get record two, save it temporarily. Go get record 18, save it temporarily. And once you're finished iterating across all 18 records, save me all of them together. And you will get this script. And you can modify it. You can save all whatevers, all top containers, all accessions, all whatevers. So the JSON for all 18 records has been written to a file named accessions.json in the same directory where this script lives. So I know where this script lives. I'm going to go to, I have, an, I have a text editor here. I'm going to go double click on accessions.json. It's messy looking. I'll format it real quick. Here is a load. So this file is saved locally to my machine. I can manipulate it if I want to. I can run a report on it. I can uh, share it somehow. If it depends on what you're doing, what are you going to do with this data? That's what it comes down to sort of like, what do you care to do? But here is, here are all 18 of my accession records in a row in one big JSON file. And so you are welcome to use this script if you have reason to save locally any records. All you have to do is change the endpoint. And I know that that's not a small thing, but I'm hoping that by reading these things, uh, you will be able to kind of figure out you only have to change the endpoint. So here in this case, you can change the endpoint by just changing this word. So if I did top containers here and restarted, I have, uh, let's see, oh, many more top containers, which makes sense. There'd be a lot of boxes. So I have 301 top containers. And if I were to run this again, I'm going to get a, another file for every top container record. So let's see, that should have just popped up. Top container, where to go? Let me refresh. I might just be missing it. Top containers, on. let me go look at the directory. Nope, nope. Top container CSV, no. Oh, I never ran it. <laughs> oh, I, you know why? I actually think it's taking a while uh, because there are 301 of them. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that open and come back to it. And the reason I know that is because there's a little asterisk here. This actually hasn't stopped uh, processing yet. But that's the end of uh, that demonstration anyway.
Okay, now let me tell you something real. Um, I understand that these examples are only so useful. You haven't actually gotten your hands on these scripts yet, and you may not even have a use case for them. Let me tell you something, though, about Archive Space itself, whether you actually run these scripts or not. And so there are two gotchas that I want you to know about. Navigating the tree, and you can see the title of this one right here, linking will fool you. So let me tell you about the tree. And this is something that is specific to archive space uh, that you're going to care about as you get into this. So this isn't a demonstration where you're gonna take away a practical script. This is a demonstration to show you something that you should know before you begin a project in archive space. The tree and ordered records. The tree, the definition of this is the structure that unites resources and archival objects into the archival hierarchy. So if you are an archivist, you are used to thinking of the hierarchy. It's one of the foundational principles of how we arrange and describe information. So in the context of how a resource record connects to its archival objects, you could have a, a huge finding aid. Think about maybe the, the biggest one your institution owns. It could have multiple series, sub-series, then different uh, levels of description. If you're familiar with EAD, think about like you could nest, you know, CO4s and CO3s and CO2s and CO1s. There's a lot of um, uh, structure to have to deal with when we think about hierarchically arranged information. How do you navigate uh, the and we also deal with the concept of inheritance, where we want to know um, if there is a component maybe that's in a restricted series. How do you know that that component is restricted? You have to look up the tree, potentially, to see that the series itself is restricted. So going up and down the tree or the hierarchy is something that only archivists have to do. It's one of the things that I can show you today that is different than just general uh, Python knowledge. So let's talk about the tree in archive space and how it gets use, used through the API. So what I mean by the tree is at the top of this record, you're used to this view, right? This view up here, you use it all the time. It's how you navigate or wayfind where you are in your collection. So once I open up my series, I see that I have subseries, I have subseries, and once I expand all of these, this is the hierarchical arrangement of my finding aid. This is the hierarchy. Letters inbound are under subseries two. Letters inbound are under series two. Business correspondence is under the Morris Canal collection. So this is the tree. It is represented very nicely here for you as a display feature of archive space. But I remember I told you to flip the ice cream switch. Though these things are nicely put together on the screen, they actually live in different places with different endpoints. This is a resource record at the very top. It is accessed by slash resources one. This is an archival object. It is accessed by slash archival objects one, and then this is slash archival objects two, slash archival objects three. How does archival object three know that it is a child of archival object two, that is a child of archival, archival object one, and that they are all children of the Morris Canal collection? These are handled by the tree. So while it's visually displayed very nicely here for you, to navigate this through the API can, is a very different experience. So just a visual. Over here, we have the resource record. Over here, we have our archival objects, series one, correspondence. The archival objects are connected between themselves contextually, that this, that this is a child of this, and that this is a sibling of this. And then all of these things together have to connect back to the tree, so this dot, to, to the resource record. So this dotted line here represents the tree. In archive space, here's our authentication slide again. In archive space, this can be um, accessed via an endpoint. So here's our requests get again. Here's our base URL again. At some point, I'm just going to stop talking about these parts because you'll hopefully become familiar with them. Repository repository. Here begins the interesting part. Slash resources one, slash tree, slash root.
Okay, so I'm actually going to pause and let you read this. Don't you don't have to read every line because you're going to see a lot of uh, information that you don't necessarily need. But um, yeah, get a little closer in your chairs to the screen and read that. So back to our finding aid, just to get us oriented, what we're seeing is we're only seeing our series. So series one photographs, series two business correspondence. And uh, oh, now I'm going to just close that one. Oh, is it done yet? Okay, it's done. Yeah, okay, it's finally done. I didn't think it was going to take that long. Uh, let me go see if top containers, okay, uh, to return to our, our other script, all 301 top containers have just been written to this document now. And that actually took a little while. There you go. So here is our all of the top containers in this entire repository. All of them. <laughs> it's a lot. See barcodes? Okay, great. So I'm glad. now I will close that script. All right, so series one photographs, series two business correspondence. So back to the tree, here's series one photographs and here's series two business correspondence. So what we have done is we have stepped down into the tree to the first level of the tree. No further, notice I have no more. I have nothing else here. So that is the tree root is go to the tree for resources one. And what is the, what is the root? The root is the uh, collection itself, and then two children. Now I'm going to move on. Uh, notice the, ah, okay. Right, I had to re-familiarize myself with these endpoints. Uh, these endpoints are complicated. So now the endpoint, look how long the endpoint is. I actually have to scroll. So now the endpoint is resource one, tree, and now we've hit a node instead of a root. And then we have to declare the node. So go to the tree node, which node archive space says, well, go to the first node, which is node URI. And it is actually archival object one. So I bet you that's going to be now a listing. And I'm actually speculating this out loud, a listing of series one's children only, not series two. Let's see what it is, because I hope that's what it is. Okay, what was uh, what was it called? Series one is called photographs. Okay, so let's see. Yep, series one photographs is now what we're looking at. And we're looking at its children. It only has two children, subseries one and subseries two. And I'm expecting that we are seeing subseries one and subseries two. We haven't yet got down to the archival object level. Uh, no, sorry, these are all archival objects. I mean the file level, the uh, descriptive level, the file level. So presumably that's what this one is. <laughs> so now we're once again populating this endpoint and we're going deeper. Now we're looking at the child of archival object two. And finally, we're actually going to get down to the file level. So we have uh, prints here, Waterloo Village, Eastern Pennsylvania, and New York, New Jersey. And so here we have Waterloo Village. And you see how much longer it is now? Because now we're really getting into, well, look, there's real stuff here. We've got Archival uh, Waterloo Village. We've got its inclusive, its creation date, 1889. And we are learning that it is uh, in box one. Folder one, it's got actual containers, mixed materials is its type. And Eastern Pennsylvania is our next one. So though painful, I thought it would be useful to show you how you navigate, one of the ways to navigate the tree 
via the tree node and tree root endpoints. And if you are curious, um, I should have showed you this a while ago. These are the, this is uh, the archive space documentation. These, this is where you find every single endpoint that I have talked to you today about. So if I just search tree on the left-hand side, I'm over here. If I just search tree, there's a depreciated endpoint. That's the old tree endpoint. Here is the node endpoint that we actually, uh, wait, no, fetch tree information. Properly. That's the second one we did. There should be a root. Here's the node from root. Look at all of the different tree endpoints. I haven't even um, look, get metadata for a Mark 21 export. <laughs> it's worth reading this. I will actually get, uh, give you this list, give you this uh, link in the chat if you ever want to go read the Archive Space API documentation. So if you have to navigate the tree, so think about what your, well, what is my use case? If you ever need to know that a piece of information is above or below where you are, you have to navigate the tree to find it. And so that is why I'm sharing these slides with you. Now, these demonstrations used the tree endpoints, such as get um, repositories and then tree node. Dealing with the tree endpoints is not intuitive. It is not. I consider them an intermediate to advanced skill in your archive space toolbox. By demonstrating the tree endpoints, I want your takeaway to be two things. The first of which is more important. The hierarchy essential to archival description is represented in the data by a concept called the tree. Point two, there are tree endpoints, but they are not the only way to see and use tree information. Just don't think you need to use the tree endpoints because I showed them to you in this presentation. Make a distinction between the concept of the tree versus the specific endpoints that say tree in them. So I wanted to tell you about the tree because it's important to know that that's how you get up and down. Essentially, that's how you get up and down in the API is to understand how do I know that this archival object is related to this one. You have to navigate the tree to do it. You can use the tree endpoints and they exist, but really what I want to tell you is that there's other ways to get around uh, these tree endpoints. So you don't necessarily have to use them, but know that they're there and know what the tree is. So here are other ways to see and use tree information, including one of my favorite endpoints ever. And I have been doing this long enough that I have favorite endpoints. So you have two ways, other ways to think about uh, the tree. So you don't have to go crazy using the tree endpoints. You can look for ancestor arrays in archival objects. So what do I mean by that? Here in my endpoint, I'm getting archival object number six. I'm not even gonna bother explaining the rest of it now because you've seen it a million times. Here is the record through um, archive space for archival object number six. That is, by the way, one, two, three, four, five, Newark, New Jersey, I think. Let's see, is that what it was called? No, Plain 10 East, uh, because it was a canal uh, over mountainous New Jersey, the Morris Canal used planes the, rather than locks or a combination of the two. So Plain 10 East, this is the archival object number six. And here we are, Plain 10 East. This is archival object number six. I want you to look for an, an array called ancestors. This tells me what are the ancestors of archival object number six? Well, using my eyes, it's subseries one prints, series one photographs, Morris Canal collection. And using the ancestor array, it's this is the archival object for subseries two prints. This is the archival object for series one photographs. And this is the archival object for the collection. So I didn't have to navigate the tree to get this information, but it is still tree info. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Okay. And then my favorite endpoint ever, <laughs> slash repository. I'm giving them th these two now raw slash repositories, insert your repo ID here, slash resources, insert your ID here, slash ordered records. This is my favorite endpoint. Get the list of URIs of this published resource and all published archival objects contained within. So 
get me the tree, <laughs> kind of, and then order them by tree order. So give me a list of every record in this collection in tree order, because it could give me a list of every record in the collection completely randomly. And then I would have lost the archival context. But this endpoint has the word ordered in it. It will give me the list of every single of every single resource in this collection, every single endpoint, but in tree order. That's very helpful. So here it is, resources slash one ordered records. Here I am still passing my header along this whole time. And here are just the URIs. Now there's no other information here. There's no dates, there's no extents, there's no notes, there's no top containers, but it is sort of a starting point. Here is resource one, Morris Canal collection. It's at the collection level. Here's archival object one, series one, it's at the series level. Subseries, file, file. So we've got beginning to see, and if for those of you who are familiar with the spreadsheet importer, or EAD, look at depth. The depth of the collection is zero because it is the root of the collection. The depth of the series is one. And if you use the spreadsheet importer, this is what you're doing. You're adding the depth when you add, uh, so it's a different way of doing the hierarchy in the spreadsheet importer, you're adding numbers. You're saying that a series is one and a file is two. And here that is. So this is the hierarchy depth three of two for the series. And then look, all of the files are depth three. So here again is another way of seeing the hierarchical representation of finding aid data that we're used to. This is level zero. This is level one, depth one. This is depth two. And then all of these are depth three. And if you were adding these in with the spreadsheet importer, that's, you would put one, two, three, 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 as the hierarchy in the spreadsheet importer. And apologies to those of you who don't use the spreadsheet importer, what I just said makes no sense. But for those who do use the spreadsheet importer, that felt good, I hope. Okay, so this is a discussion, it's been a critical discussion about how and where you can find tree data, and what it's like to have to navigate the tree in the API and that there are tree endpoints so you can see that anytime that there's yellow text on the screen, it's highlighting the word tree. There are tree endpoints. I consider them difficult to use, but there are other ways of finding tree information via other endpoints and via the records themselves. And finally, I feel like I have rushed these and I'm sure that some of you are quite detached at this point, <laughs> but I have one more uh, presentation. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Marcella asks, but the ordering is only going to be based on the random number assigned by the system when you create an archival object, right? So if you do intellectual arrangement on a collection after the fact, will the ordering command giving you, uh, giving you in the intellectual order or the randomly assigned number order? Let's test it, Marcella. So let's go back and let's say I have rearranged this collection. I'm going to do something very small. I am going to move. Oh, no, no wrong button. I'm going to enter uh, enable mode and I am going to move subseries one below subseries two. So no, no uh, tricks up my sleeve. That's what happened. I'm going to disable reorder mode. And now you can all see a refresh just for, just for good measure. Okay. So now we can all see together that I have moved uh, subseries two below subseries one. Let's pretending that we just did a physical arrangement, a rearrangement of the collection. Now, because this is cached on the screen, we can see that subseries one prints is first under series one photographs. I will reissue the command and you can see that it has moved. So this is not based on archival object order. This is based on the tree and the tree is represented in the database and is thus represented by the endpoints. So if you see it represented here, that is the view you are going to get whenever you are dealing with the tree endpoint. I hope that helps.
it is usually it is it is an easy to observe coincidence that archival objects are created in the order in which they are created but they are actually being maintained by this extra level of uh, control in the database called the tree. So the endpoints will always reflect the tree. Great question. Okay, so last but not least, and it might have to be last because we are coming to the end of our time. Although I can take a vote at some point, um, if I should just keep recording, uh, you can all go home. <laughs> but I do want to pause for questions. Actually, I'll tell you what I have uh, one really I have one more important thing to tell you called uh, linking will fool you. But I will pause to see if there are any questions or I'll tell you what because we are coming late on time. If you have any questions, please start filling up the Q&A with them and then I will make sure that the uh, end of time doesn't come before I answer some questions. And I'll uh, what that means is so that the people who would be typing would be have their attention fractured. So I'll wait just a few seconds to see if anybody has any questions. And then I will talk about how linking will fool you. I'm not seeing anything, but use this opportunity to start typing if you have a question. So my last point, which is a point that I think is important because um, it will it will fool you, essentially, is exploring link direction, uh, subtitled the staff interface may fool you. So I'm going to start on agent records. So let's go look at this agent record. Here we go. This is the Morris Canal and Banking Company, uh, founders of the Morris Canal in New Jersey. And you can see that I have two linked records from this creator. We have um, the resource record, the Morris Canal collection and the Tiny the Cow papers are both listed on the screen. This is really easy. You can come here, especially in reference and say, what do we have by the Morris and Canal Company, Banking Company? And we'd be like, oh, we have two collections. Fantastic. This makes it seem like this information is stored on the agent record because that's where I am. I'm on agents, corporate agent 101. But these pieces of information, the links aren't here. And this is why this is going to fool you. You cannot see the records linked to an agent or a subject through the API like you can in the staff interface. You can only see the agents and subjects linked from records. That might hurt your brain. It will, it will, um, it will bite you in archive space. So while it looks like these are linked from this collection, this agent, because you can see them on the screen, they are only linked to this agent, and that matters for the API. So for example, here's my authentication again. I'm gonna go get that corporate entity. Here it is, corporate entity 101, Morrison Canal Banking Company. Nowhere in this record is there a reference to either the Tiny the Cow Papers or the Morris Canal Collection. So if your question for the API is, say it's a cleanup project and you wanna go clean up I don't know anything that's associated with this, you can't start here. You'll hit a dead end. Even though it shows you in the staff interface that these two things are related, are, are related, this is a display feature. It doesn't actually represent the real data behind the scenes. In the real data behind the scenes, this is a dead end for your script for an API call. There is no information about the two resource records that this is linked from. So, this matters because if you're looking to use the API to create or change links between records, you must change and create the link via the endpoint from the record from which for the record from which the link originates. So in order to change a link to the Morrison Canal agent record, you have to go find it on the resource record where it originated from. You cannot change the resources an agent links to from the agent record. You can only do it from the resource record. 
And a pro tip is, is that this is true in the interface too. So just because I can see these, I can't add any here, but I would have to go to another resource record in the interface and add the Morrison Canal Banking Company as an agent, and then the link would have been created. So this um, can also matter in an even more extreme example. So top container cleanup is something that has been a huge part of my life. So here's a record for box one, and you can see all of the different linked records. So each of these prints lives in box one. Top container cleanup is a big part of, I think, a lot of institutions' lives, but remember my bias is that I do a lot of top container, I do a lot of cleanup. So looking at this, it looks really simple to be like, hey, I wanna change all of the instances that link to box one. You can't because box one, so here's top container one, has no information about those archival objects, none. There were seven of them, but you can't see them from this, this, top, this, this link. You can tell that it's part of the Morris Canal collection, but there are no, top, there are no accession records here, or there are no uh, archival objects here. So to reinforce the point, you cannot see the records linked to a top container through the API like you can in the staff interface. You can only see the top containers linked from those records. Any discussion of linking in top containers is also a good moment to explore instances through the API. So it's also good to know that physical information in an AO lives in two places. So really quickly, what I mean by physical instances is, of course, there is an instance down here, mixed materials, folder four, indicator four, box one. You might already see where I'm going with this. Box one is its own endpoint. I'm on archival object six. So what's interesting is the words mixed material, folder four, and folder and four live here on archival object six, but box one lives on top containers slash one, which is a different endpoint. So in archival objects, information lives in the instance array, which is where you'll find the instance type like mixed materials and the folder and item number, but then the top container information lives someplace else. So in order to construct the simple phrase, if I want to demonstrate this using this very simple phrase, box one, folder four, really simple. Except that that one phrase is four pieces of information that you have to access via two different endpoints. First, from the archival object, you get the folder number and the, and the type, essentially folder four. And then through the top container ID, you get the box one and folder one. It's incredibly difficult to actually put together the phrase box one folder four. I'm actually gonna show you this. So here's a statement in the color coding matters. Start from the archival object record, find the instance array, find the folder information and link to a top, and the link to a top container. So here I am, I'm in this instances array there's folder four, or is it folder four, mixed materials, and then the link to the top container. So this is the color coding for my variables in my Python script that shows you how to find those things. So I'm sorry, it barely fits on the screen, but in the instances array, which is yellow, in the instances array, in the instances array, and in the instances array, I have to find the folder information, which is in green, and then the link to the top container, which is in blue. And these are all um, how I'm populating a script to go and find this information. And so we've got folder four now, and we have the info we need to go to find the container. But then the next stage in our script is follow the link to the top container and grab the container info. Now I have to go someplace else, get box one. 
And so here again is the color coding, the follow the link to the top container. Let me make this smaller. Follow the link to the top container. I had to go here to the top container URI. And then I had to find the container info, which is here and here. So all of this together are all the different things I have to do <laughs> with the color coding intact. And don't worry, you'll get a PDF of these slides. So you'll be able to look at this slide in more detail. I'm obviously rushing at the end of the presentation. All of these different data sources and all these different variables in a Python script all come together just, I'm doing this a little quickly now, just to get us box one, folder four. So that's another way that linking uh, can kind of kick you is that all you want is a simple piece of information that is described uh, really easily in one place uh, for your eyes to read in the staff interface. But it actually is, a, you have to write a script that starts in one place, links out to another place, and all of that just to get uh, one, one kind of simple piece of information. So now you're going to start to kind of pay attention as you use archive spaces to which record types you are on and what their endpoints might be, which you can kind of see in the top of the screen here. Now I had a whole other demonstration to give you. I'm going to skip it because I'm going to come back to the presentation uh, in PowerPoint and talk about uh, some pro tips and go really fast right here at the end, uh, which I apologize for. Uh, I may keep, keep uh, speaking after the time is up. So if anybody wants to simply leave, please be my guest. And I will uh, continue to record the last uh, 10 minutes of the presentation. Okay, so some important tips and reminders. Session time is the same. So if you get logged out after an hour in the staff interface, same for the API. You can change this in the config. Uh, Reauthentication which is what happens when you just are automatically reauthenticated might be handled by certain libraries. I think Archive Snake may handle it, but uh, requests does not. So if all of a sudden your uh, script suddenly fails one day in the future, did it happen at exactly 60 minutes? That might be why, because you've, uh, you have got logged out because your session time is too short. You need a local Ar Archive Space account to access the API. So you cannot authenticate to the API using your institu institution's main authentication method. Remember that your permissions still matter. If you can't do it in the interface, using the endpoint for the same action will be no different. But the API documentation will not mention permissions. So for example, there is an endpoint documented called slash update feed that only archive space can use. Not you, not admin, I may be admin, but not a, not a normal user. And there's nothing in the archive space documentation that lets you know that update feed is an endpoint that's uh, only meant for the system and not for you, a human. Let me, uh, let me check the chat just in case. Where's the chat? Okay, more pro tips. Know your link directions. Record linking is not bi-directional. This is what I was getting to. You, just because a link a link has two uh, points, of course it is, uh, else it wouldn't be a link, but you can only change that link on one side. Test your linking assumptions before finalizing your project. This will absolutely bite you because you think you can link to something from something else and you might be wrong. Be careful of overwrites. When posting content back to pre-existing record, you must post everything. Anything left out will be overwritten as blank. Some fields don't appear if empty. Um, I had hoped to demonstrate this to you. I'm happy that I uh, wrote it out. Example, if you have a top container without a barcode, there won't be an empty barcode field in the JSON. So it won't be like barcode, barcode blank. There just won't be a barcode field. There just won't be a barcode field at all. This will drive you crazy. This is another reason to start all of your testing in the interface. And this is something that I was going to talk about a little bit more in my last, in my last example as I run you through um, what I do when I start a project. Never test against production. So what I mean by that is do whatever it takes to not work directly in production until you are ready. Always make backups. 
Ask IT or your hosting provider for a backup immediately before undertaking an API project and alert your coworkers that you are about to start to do work in there. Wait for the indexer. So if you're about to make thousands of changes in a short time, Archive Space will need time to catch up. It is not, it, the change is instant, but it will not display to you instantly. The indexer will have to uh, catch up with you. Wait a few minutes to an hour or more if you don't see immediate results when you were sure you should. I once panicked because I'd worked hours on a script. I thought it was successful and nothing happened. I went and got a cup of coffee to calm myself down. And by the time I came back, everything had showed up. Uh, when you are testing whether or not something was successful, uh, use edit mode in the staff interface for these kinds of checks, not view mode and not the PUI. The API isn't your only solution, and this is something I wish I could talk more about. Uh, here's an example of a description of a project through API to get rid of commas. So say you have trailing commas on your titles. You would have to get all archival objects and then get HAO and then check the title. And if it doesn't have a comma, continue the script. But if it does have a comma, trim the comma and then replace the value and then post the entire record back in and then check the status of the post and then move on to the next archival object. Or, yeah, SQL. So <laughs> I've completely changed my life in the last year, uh, maybe it's the last six months, by learning SQL. Everything that I just said on the left-hand side is what you'd have to do with a Python script. And those three lines on the right-hand side do the exact same thing by working directly in SQL in the database. So how do you know when to use the API versus when to use SQL? I'm thinking about doing an entire presentation on just this. You probably want the API if you're creating new data, period. You probably want the API if you're changing data and the change relies on the archival context or the hierarchy. Like, add an access restrict note to any child of any child that is marked as restricted because you have to know what's above or below that in order to make that change or flag any top container linked to any archival object at the series level because maybe you didn't want archival objects at the series level or maybe you didn't want top containers at the series level. So anytime that you're relying on the hierarchy, you probably want the API, but you can probably use SQL if your change does not require the hierarchy. So we'll start with that. And if you want simple custom reports, if all you're doing is to say how many accessions are not processed and how many extents do I have for collections that have the classification of university records. And if you can come up with a statement like that and the custom reports don't do it or, or the reports don't do it, you can use SQL to do custom reporting. And uh, very many thanks to Alicia Didlich for that uh, observation a few years ago, which really opened my mind to that. And finally, for simple changes, and here's what's simple. Simple is if it only takes a few nouns and one verb to describe it. So look, uh, my old example was a huge paragraph about what I needed to do. Unpublish all digital objects. That's one verb and a few nouns. Remove all trailing commas is one verb and a few nouns. And find all ampersands is one verb and two nouns. You can probably do it through uh, SQL if that is the case. Now, very quickly, uh, this is a whole bunch of stuff that I might re-record and append to the end of this video for people to watch in the future, but I want you to know that you're going to get uh, the API playbook, which has three major sections, which are these red, uh, these uh, headings on the left-hand side. Ignore the rest of the slide, just look at the headings on the left-hand side. I recommend in my playbook that you take three major steps. Get access to an API for testing. I tell you how to do that in my playbook. Get an API client like Postman and practice your endpoints. I tell you exactly how to do that in the playbook. These two first sections, this pink and this blue, I really do walk you through it. And I, and I, I give you everything that you need to know with no ambiguity. It sets you up for the green part, which is the thing that I don't think I can do for you, which is to begin your scripting journey. So there, after the pink part, after the blue part, the advice that I give you in the green section is not so much do exactly this, click this, click this. Section I give you, the, the advice I give you in the green section is here are some courses to take. Here's the order of events in courses that you should kind of focus on. I give you a few direct examples of things that I have done. I give you sample scripts. I give you some gotchas and I let you know what you should pay attention to in the scripting journey. But admittedly, the third part of the playbook is just a general guide. It doesn't have as much detailed information as the pink. I'm actually happy to finish 
because it's all top of my mind. So um, I'll tell you what now, everyone, if you'd like to 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 bow out, please do. I will not take it personally. Um, even if I'm only speaking to an audience of one in Jessica, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue. Uh, it'll be two parts. I'm going to do one last demonstration with the Jupyter Notebook script, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about my API playbook. Although I think generally what I said is still true. The first two portions are really going to walk you through things, and then the last portion isn't. So feel free to to just leave, um, no problem, but also feel free to stay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do one last demonstration. This last demonstration is called uh, templating a project. And so this is exactly what I do. I go through the same few steps, even though I obviously have experience with this, I go through the same few steps every single time. And let's see, I actually see a question in the Q&A. Comments about using SQL has got me thinking about my use cases. Aha, uh, Margaret. So uh, Margaret has asked a question about whether or not there's a good resource about uh, getting started with SQL workflows in archive space. Yes, there is. Um, in my, hold on a second. So I'm gonna give you a very brief look at my, don't worry, we're not going on a break. Here's my archive space playbook. Here it is live. It's going to change a little bit over the next few days. But Margaret, when you get here, look for just 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 control find. <laughs> just control find SQL, SQL. And I will bring you down to this little section. And underneath this section where I talk a little bit about it, I give you two. And this list might actually expand because uh, Alicia did something just yesterday. So as soon as Jessica gets those videos posted and, and everything, and I get to catch up and catch my breath, I will add another uh, resource here. At, right here, these are the two things that I used to get started uh, in talking about Archive Space and SQL. Uh, Maureen's blog here uh, helps you get uh, MySQL Workbench set up directly on your computer. And then Alicia gives good examples on how to get started with reporting. And so these are the two, two things that I would uh, point you to right here. So once you get uh, the link to my playbook, go right there. And those are the only the two things that come to mind immediately. And I'll also check the chat. Ah, yes, you got it. Okay, great. So back to the presentation. I will go through these slides and I thank Jessica for uh, spending her evening with me. <laughs> Okay, so while giving this presentation, I've actually been twice asked the exact same question. And so having been sent, uh, having been given the exact same question twice, I assume that it is a, is a question I should answer. So the question was, can you demonstrate a script that creates container records from a CSV? Okay, let's just use this as a how to template an API project. And this is pretty much a simple one. So I, I liked this one as a good example. So in preparation for this workshop, I decided to work on that specifically to show you the steps I take when templating out a new project. Obviously, I have experience doing this, but even with that experience, I start with some basics each and every time. This is truly how I do it. This is truly the steps I take. So here we go. Let's couch this task in a scenario that I've actually faced. So here's a hypothetical. You work in an institution that attaches containers to accession records. Okay. 40 boxes of a new physical collection have just come in. Those boxes need to be barcoded and then top containers need to be created for them and linked to the appropriate accession record. Creating and linking 40 top containers by hand is a chore, especially for an accession because you can't create something like the, you can't use the spreadsheet importer. So creating and linking 40 top containers by hand is a chore. So staff want to be able to do this via CSV instead. What would it take to do this through the API? So what would it take to create 40 top containers through the API from a CSV and then link them to an accession record? So the goal is to write a script that, and notice this, sources from a CSV and creates containers through the API and then links those containers to an accession record by populating that accessions instance array. Note that this is a two-step process. Even if I only write one script to do it, I still have to do two things. I still have to create containers and link containers. So there are two discrete tasks. And why are they two discrete tasks? Because they have two different endpoints and it can only ever work with one endpoint at a time, even if I'm working with them very fast. So, from my API playbook, this happens to be a quote. 
this is a quote of um, where I tell you to get started. So from my API playbook, one of my first pieces of advice is pick a record type that you wish you could change or create. Even if you have to change a thousand records, even if you have a huge project, you're completely overwhelmed by, oh my goodness, I have to change like 5,000 top containers. Even if you have to change 5,000 top containers, just pick one, start there. This will be your template for your project and a proof of concept for your approach, because I don't want you to get five days into banging your head against the API wall and then realize that your proof of concept actually doesn't work. What you want to do can't be done or has to be done in a different way. So focus really intensely on that first one record. If you're creating something from scratch, and that's the difference between creating something from scratch versus editing something, because they are two different, I, I propose that those are two different workflows, two different ways of thinking about uh, working with the API. So if you're creating something from scratch, create it in the staff interface first, then get it out using Postman. This is your template. And this is what I use Postman for. So why use Postman? For exactly this, for doing just one little record. So let's set the stage for templating. I'm gonna be flipping back and forth between multiple windows to go through these stages. So step one, go to the staff interface and create a top container linked to an accession. I'm gonna leave out the barcode for now and note how this is a two-step process even when I do it in the staff interface. I still take two steps, I create and I link. So let's watch that happen. I'm gonna to browse to accessions. I'm, going to, I'm actually gonna be working with accession one through the API. So I'll do my test through accession two. So here's my fake accession two record. And all I want to do is I want to create just one top container for this. So I'm going to say it's fixed materials. And remember I said that even in the staff interface, it's a two-stage process. Look what's about to happen. You've probably done this a million times, but think about it for the first time. I'm on another screen. I'm creating a box here and hitting create and link because this screen hits the top container endpoint. Got it. I've created my box. And now when I hit save accession here, that's creating the link. That is hitting the accession endpoint. So it's a two-stage process. First create the box, then create the, the link. So now it's true. Let's just confirm. We have a one instance to box one on accessions two. It's up here in the address bar. Okay, so back to my, I'm going to actually start to pare down my open, uh, open windows here because I'm just getting overwhelmed. Okay, so that's what we did. We did step one. We've noted how it's a two-step process and I did leave out the barcode just for now. I just want to show you something. Okay, so now task one, create containers. Let's get the top container out through Postman and explore the record. And we're gonna note two things. We're gonna note that the barcode field isn't present and we're gonna go back and add the barcode uh, and show you how that appears. This killed me the first time that it happened to me. So that's why I talk about it. Oh, uh, quickly, what's our endpoint? So we have to go find that top container. And our top container endpoint is top containers slash 621. The reason there's 621 is because I've been uh, working on this instance for a long time. <laughs> even though there's only two resource records in it. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to Postman. I'm gonna authenticate. I'm gonna grab my session key, the manual annoying way. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna plop it where it needs to be. And I'm gonna to go to top container slash 621. I hope I got that right. So here's my endpoint, repositories 101, top containers 621. Okay. I picked the right endpoint. Good for me. All right. So we're templating. We're templating, which means temp so a template is a guide by which we will create all the rest of our 40 top containers. The 40 top containers that was our point. We have a new collection comes in, 40 boxes. So I'm using this JSON record as a template. So two important things to note. This is actually going to be a little bit easier than you think. It's going to get hard in a second, but what I'm about to show you is actually pretty cool. So first of all, let's note that we have no barcode. What I find 
counterintuitive about archive space is that you'd think, fine, barcode is going to be in my JSON record, but blank. It's not here. There is no field called barcode here. And boy, this will kill you because you're here to template something. And so you're just staring at it and saying, well, where's the field? Where's barcode? Why isn't barcode here? If you didn't know that these fields disappear, you might just assume, I don't know what you would assume. You can't assume anything from a negative. There's nothing here. And so where does the barcode information live? I don't know why. So for instance, active restrictions is empty. So let's go back to our, oh, that, that's because it's a, uh, let's say ILS holding ID. Is that there? That's empty too. Nope. So sometimes fields come in blank and sometimes they just don't exist. So I'll go here, put on a fake barcode, save the container, and now watch what happens. You know it's going to happen. I'm going to hit send. I'm going to get to this record again. And now there's a barcode field. So that is another reason why it is really important to start in the staff interface for a new project, because the staff interface will show you every possible field. Because And if you start in the API instead, unless you have each one of these uh, record types completely memorized, you will have no idea. Uh, barcode, it may be a little bit more obvious, but let's say you're in a much bigger record, like an agent or a resource. Do you have every field memorized? Probably not. So that's why it's important to start in the interface, make the interface record look the way you want. And then only then, and after you've saved it, go and get it through the API. And then this is your template. Okay, here's our template. We have a successfully created top container. Now we know that this is what we have to make our other top containers look like as we create our 40 boxes. So let's go back to our presentation and see what our next step is. So we did, we noted how the barcode field isn't present and we went back and we added a barcode. All right, great. Now let's attempt to post a new container. And we do this by exploring the record requirements. And so here's the part of this that I actually think is pretty cool. It's a lot of information here. There's these curly brackets, there's these, this is a tab, this is like a square bracket followed by a curly bracket, followed by a this, followed by a that. It seems kind of like a pain to create a new one of these, especially because we're doing this part manually. Let me show you something that I have learned. I'm just gonna, sh just gonna tell it to you outright. I'm not gonna like walk you through how I learned this. I'm gonna attempt to create a new container. Not a container attached to, to accession two, just a new container. So in order to do that, I'm gonna uh, switch this to post. I'm gonna take away the ID because I no longer care about top container 621. I just want a new container. Here's something I've learned. Very little of this is actually required for a new record. Watch how many lines I take away. I think, I think I can take away all of these. In fact, if you look at my asterisks on a top container record, oy, I'm gonna close that out because I don't need that anymore. Okay. When you look at my asterisks on a top container record, there's only one required field, only one indicator. I think to create a top container that literally the only thing I need is an indicator number. <laughs> I've never tried that before, but maybe I'll try it right now. So what I'm about to attempt to do is post just to top containers. No, no ID here, just these lines. And I'm going to change the uh, barcode to something that I can easily search for. So let's try uh, six, so it's, it's six, five, four, three, two, one. So I can search for it. And I'm going to send. Had some trouble parsing my request. Okay, maybe I can't do it. Ah, I think it's because I have a trailing comma. Okay. Did it. Yes, trailing comma for the win. So this is all I need. 
and I created a top container. I created top container 622. And here it is, 622. Boom. Here's my 654321. Let's see if my theory is correct that actually all I need, uh, this might be true. Actually, all I need is, oh, close. Can I type just an indicator? Can I send just that to archive space? Yes. 623. So creating new data through the API is actually not that bad because what you think is this huge giant JSON record that you have to deal with in the end for a top container record was just this. Just that. That's awesome. It's also one of the reasons that I like a top container as an example, because a top container is a really small record. So my template for this project is actually just this right there. Open curly bracket, barcode, indicator, type, close curly bracket. That's it. So my Python script. So if these are the only fields I need to create a top container with a barcode, then these are the three columns I'll put in my CSV. So each column in my CSV, column one might be barcode, sorry about that, column two might be indicator, and column three is type for box. So let's go create a CSV template based on what we learned in Postman. So I happen to already have one. Here's a really, really simple spreadsheet. Container type, indicator, and barcode. And as we just learned, this could just be indicator. And I would have viable, I would have viable data to, to pass to archive space. So here I am, my staff is now working. Okay, staff, 40 boxes just came in. Go populate this spreadsheet for 40 boxes, labeled one through 40, and go uh, you know, wand in the barcodes on all of those different boxes and bring me back a CSV with 40 lines in it. Our CSV only has, you know, five, five containers. Bring me back a CSV with 41 lines in it, which would be our 40 boxes. And now our goal is to, is to parse these three, these only five lines into JSON and post it to the top container endpoint. So map the CSV columns to the fields in JSON. This is where it gets back into being scary Python. But what this block of code does is it takes the CSV on one side. Here it is. It happens to be called containers for CSV. And it maps to JSON. So type equals container type. Barcode equals barcode. Indicator equals indicator. One half of this equation is, hey, go to the CSV column called type, find something, and map it into a new JSON record and put it with the key called container type. So here's a perfect example. I'm going to run this. And so this is live right from that CSV that I have created type equals box, barcode equals whatever, indicator equals one. And of course, there were five of them. So you can see one, two, three, four, five. Now, each of these is printed slightly differently. This is what this did as a Python list. This is a stage one to creating JSON, is first create a Python list. And then once you have that list, encode that list as JSON, ready for the API. That happens, by the way, if you come back and you watch this, that happens right here. JSON dumps is a term that's saying convert this to JSON. The differences are subtle. It takes a single quote and it makes it a double quote, but it's also, it's doing other important, it, essentially when you're dealing with a really big data set, you always want to encode something directly as JSON. And so now I can pass the JSON straight to the top container API uh, endpoint, just the way I did right here, but really fast. So next slide, once mapped, which we've done, it's very simple mapping create the new containers, and then temporarily hold on to their URIs because it's a two-stage process. I know that this script is now getting very big. It is not easily readable, but this is the script now that combines my, this is my authentication from here on up, our familiar authentication. And right here, from here down, is me taking the information from the CSV and mapping it to a JSON, to a tiny, tiny, tiny little JSON record. And then right here, post, I am posting each one of those 
to the API. And then the rest of this is all nice, like printing stuff to make this look nice. The other thing I'm doing is I am holding onto the newly created record URIs because I'm going to need them when I link to my accession. Oh, wait, I'm supposed to run that. Hold on. Oops. Uh, hold on. Okay, I have to run this. And now what has happened is I posted this beautiful little tiny mini JSON record to here. Here's my uh, endpoint. And I got a status created. Perfect. And I got a new URI. So I created top containers 624, 625, 626 through 628. And then I, I'm going to hold on to those as a list. So here is your list of newly created URIs because now they've been created. So if we go back to archive space and go to manage containers, we've just created five orphans. And we can tell because we can click unassociated containers, yes. And we're going to get five, seven records. Oh, right, because I was playing around before. Remember, I was playing around in Postman. Here are the ones. Here's my six, five, four, three, two, one. So they're orphans because, yes, they've been created, but they haven't been associated with anything yet. So that's why I knew to search for them via unassociated containers. So these are, have been created, but they're not attached to my resource, to my accession record yet. Okay. So now time to link these guys to our accession record. So to explore the, inst the instance array in the accession record, this gets a little complicated. So we've already zoomed past beginner. So even for me, this made me pause and have to really think about how to complete these links. So now let's explore how the instance array in the accession record looks. And let me acknowledge that we've already zoomed past beginner here. So an instance array is a list, which is a type of object. It's not just a noun. A list in Python means something. It's a significant word. So an instance array is a list. And I have to know that in order to manipulate it. By the way, Python is fantastic with lists. Like this is exactly what Python is built for is like little data manipulation stuff like this is just per perfect for Python. So an instance array is a list and that's important to know. And what we need to create are actually three lists that we append to the instance array as a single object. So I apologize that we have gone past beginner here, but this is real life. So list number one, I said that there were three lists. Uh, there are actually the three lists uh, from our CSV data. And then the fourth list is the instance array itself. I, I hope that that will come out as we talk about it. So list number one is the top container ref in the, oh, that is the, no, the top container ref is the container we populated from the CSV load. I think what I'm supposed to have below here is another slide. Aha, okay. So here's a real instance array from, uh, from, an, from, an, from an accession. So what we're doing is we're essentially, now we're learning how, now we're templating, how are we supposed to add our container information to the accession. We template that by using an instance array from an accession that already has stuff attached to it. So we have mixed materials here. We have something that's already an instance. The piece of information that we generated from our CSV back here, the only thing that we are uh, par passing to the Archive Space API that we created, that we, we were responsible for with that CSV, is this right here. So in the last step, we created five containers, orphans. From each of those, we saved a URI. Now our goal is we have to get those five URIs here. But this is why I say that there are actually, we have to populate a number of lists. So see if you can pay attention with me, is, and, and this is how it goes. This is itself a list inside this list. Inside this list, inside this list. So I have to start at the bottom, build a list inside of a list, inside of a list, inside of a list, maybe I've lost track. So up here, this is what I meant. List number one 
is the top container ref down here. Ref, ref is reference. That is the container that we created from the CSV. It's inside the top container, which is inside the subcontainer, which is in the instances array. So that's our end goal, what I just showed you, the text there. That's what it's supposed to look like in the end. But to confirm, we are actually starting with an empty instance. And so let me show you that. So this is now accessions one. So that is the actual accession that we plan on adding our top containers to. So let me go to it, browse, uh, browse accessions, accession one. This is the chicken poop collection. <laughs> uh, so we have, I can confirm for you now that we have zero instances, but we are on accession one. Now we have to go populate the instance array. At first, the instance array is just this. What that is, is an empty list. It's just two square brackets. It says there's nothing here. So how do we get those square brackets to look more like this? So here's that the same set of square brackets, by the way. See the uh, opening bracket and the closing bracket? Now what I have to do is build a list inside of a list, inside of a list, inside of a list, and make our empty list five entries long, one for each top container. Okay, so here's, I'm confirming that it's empty. And now populate the empty accession array with our new containers. This is where I populate each list. And so when you get the script, this is another one of the scripts that you're getting. You see all of this, I, I commented the heck out of these things to make it very clear what I'm doing. Here, I create list one, I populate list one, I create list two, I populate list two with list one, and then uh, onward and upward, I won't read every line. And then I create the instance array. And I know that that is pretty tough, but here's what these lines do. We created top containers 624, 625, and 626. You remember those numbers from earlier through 628. There they are. And we just looked at the template when we saw that the ref was inside the top container, was inside the subcontainer, and is essentially inside. Here's the open bracket and the closed bracket is at the bottom, inside the array. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to pull down the entirety of the accession record as it is. I'm going to replace an empty list because the list is empty right now with a full list and then post the entire record back. And I have to post the entire record back or else I'll wipe all of the important information at the top of the record and only end up with five boxes and no important disposition and inventory and provenance information. So this ends up being, by the way, the longest script that you receive from me. So post the accession with a new populated instance array, which will finish the linking part of our script. And believe it or not, that part is just handled, the posting of the new record is just handled by these three lines, all the hard work were all the lines above. So here now is our accession. We know it's the accession because it is the stored in the barn one. And as we scroll down, now our instances array is not just an empty, here by the way are other empty lists, but now instances is not empty. It has five references in it. 624, 625, 626, 627, 628. And that means that when we go back to archive space and refresh, we now have five top containers attached to our accession record. These five top containers were populated from a CSV. Now, while that's all very painful, having written it, if you really were an institution that had to manually create top containers for accessions, now you can give your staff this spreadsheet and go crazy because they can populate this with hundreds of box records 
And then as long as you run this against this script, against the right accession, you can create hundreds to thousands of new instances for your accessions. Uh, one thing to note in production, I think, let me look at the full script. So the next slide, by the way, is the full script. You always see me show you only uh, bits at a time. This is the full script. So this is the script I would give you. One thing I want to make sure before I actually give it to you is that this wouldn't overwrite. Would this overwrite if there already had been? Okay, I'm going to make sure I'm going to put in a safety mechanism before I actually give this to you to make sure that you don't overwrite accessions uh, that were already there. Like this assumes that there were no accessions there. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water. I haven't talked for a while. <clears throat> I don't want to give you a script that would overwrite instances. So I'll actually go in and confirm that. So though that was by far the most advanced example, that is the stages that I took. What the biggest takeaway from that is template your work by first doing what you want to do manually in the staff interface. Then get the records out through Postman. Experiment with putting records back in through Postman just one at a time. Get your error messages. Try to figure out what you can do. Maximize yourself by learning something like this that you only have to post an indicator to make a to make a uh, top container. That's awesome. To me, that's so, so cool that it looks so complicated if you take it out. 628. Look at how much record you get out, and uh, how much information you get out. And really, all you have to do is put that in. That's so cool. OK. With that, I will not go through the slides uh, for my API playbook because I, um, well, really quickly. So. Uh, you will receive my API playbook. Once again, these are the major section headings. I walk you through getting access to an API for testing. And so the, the ways that you can do that are, and that you'll get these slides. You can use a copy of your production data in your own sandbox. Do you have a sandbox? So these are questions that you can ask to your IT department. Sorry, I keep clicking. Do you have a sandbox? Is the API open? What's the URL? So if you already have a sandbox, use your archive space sandbox to do your testing. If you don't have a sandbox, you can download and run AS locally on your machine. And I have instructions for that in the playbook. It will be blank, though. You won't be using your production data. So it'll be blank. That's the give and take between that method versus the other method. Having a real sandbox means you have all thousands of your records to play with. Having a blank instance on your local machine is really convenient, but blank. You could also use the Sandbox API, especially if you're really just getting started. Um, if you don't even have a, if you don't even have a project in mind yet, uh, just go use the Sandbox API and you can play with it there. You can, uh, anything there though will be overwritten. And then we move away from the pink stages. So the pink stages are just get access to an API for testing. And I do literally give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that in the uh, playbook itself. Then I recommend that you download Postman or you can pick another API client. It just happens to be the one that I use and that I have given you slides for. And start poking around, get stuff down, push stuff back, explore arrays, um, compare what you see in the interface to what you see in the JSON. That's a really important one because the interface is uh, sometimes a false witness to what data really looks like. Practice using your endpoints. So today you saw me use endpoints for just the major record types, successions, resources, agents, but there's all those other endpoints. There's locations, there's endpoints that function as functions, not just record types. Then move into scripting. Acknowledge that it's a journey. Uh, you may not want to take on an entirely new career goal, or maybe you do. Whichever it is, it will take time. You will get frustrated. You will hit dead ends. Uh, you might also want structure where there is none, i.e. there isn't an eight-week course on Python for archivists using the API, and you'll have to cobble things together yourself, and that can be difficult. Some of the ways to deal with that difficulty are Share it and cultivate buy-in. And this is real advice. I would not be here without other humans. This isn't just me and the internet learning this. This is me and like 
10 people who over time have taken me under their wing and, turn and, and taught me. If there are other people at your inst institution that might care about this, especially when we're back in the office or when you're back in the office, start a club, <laughs> share it, cultivate buy-in. Uh, you'll learn from each other. It's real advice. And at the bottom there, you'll see a little message to managers. Uh, consider funding and time for Python classes for staff. Uh, this is going to take a while, so you won't get immediate results, but it is an investment in the long-term uh, operation of your of your archives or your, your cultural institution. If you can't do funding or time, there are other things that you can do. You can advocate for new relationships in your organization. So for example, if your IT department is very fluent in Python and they use APIs all the time, could you be the one that kind of opens the conversation with your IT department to say, can we have an archivist's working group? Can you guys do some cross training for our, for our staff? Can you get to learn and trust each other a little bit more about having archivists actually make changes uh, directly to APIs? Can you get us a sandbox? Yeah. And also uh, your manager, you might, if you're a manager, you might need to advocate for getting a staff um, admin privileges on their machines, because some of the things that you're gonna have to download in the universe that you're starting to explore, uh, one of the least things you could do is at least um, advocate getting uh, admin privileges on work machines so that um, the people interested in using Python and doing more advanced things will have that ability to do so. These are just the major sections heads uh, of my API playbook. I will not go through them uh, given, given the accelerated pace here. And that is the end of prepared content, <laughs> finally. Okay, thank you so much for waiting. I will pause here uh, for just a few more minutes. We still have 11 hangers on, awesome for you guys. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with me, and I hope that the uh, you know the ultimate recording uh, will be helpful and not just a representation of having gone over time on one day of the year. <laughs> I will stop talking. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead and stop talking. Get a drink. Take a breath. You have been talking. Um, yeah, we still have people who are hanging on. Uh, congratulations to you if you are still with us. You are the MVPs of this workshop for sure. Um, but like Valerie said, this is primarily for the recording and for posterity for people and for yourselves so that you can come back and review this when you're ready or when it makes sense for you to do that. But if you have any questions, please go ahead and drop them into the chat. Just some more thank yous. This is very informative. <laughs> this presentation was too good. I couldn't tear myself away. <laughs> it was much what it was much watch a workshop for sure. I know nothing about coding, but you made this accessible. Thank you so much for your work. That's for sure, Valerie. You definitely make it accessible. That feels really nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you for right. being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Valerie. Thank you again so much. This is great. Um, since I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, we will go ahead and end now. Um, Valerie, you have the recording, so I'll leave it to you to do with it what you see fit and then share whenever you're ready. Um, but I am going to go ahead and end it. Uh, thank you all very much. And uh, thank you to Valerie. I'll see you all at the next Archive Space event. Bye, everyone. <laughs>